are prepared to go forward. Uh, hopefully you've had a good weekend, and uh, it always is so short. We have uh, the witness, uh, Mr. Masterson, back on the stand for the third, fourth time. Um, Mr. Franzel, uh, let's go ahead and complete his testimony, if you would, please. Good morning, detectives. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Give me a second to set up here. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, on Friday, I asked you about the February 15th interview with Michael Herman at the station. Um, you remember that? Yes. Okay. And I asked you whether he told you in that interview whether Ms. Harwick was still screaming when he ran out of the house. Yes. And you testified that you couldn't recall. Correct. Um, and then I was looking for the page in the transcript, but I couldn't find it, and I said I'd come back to it, right? Okay, yes. So, um, I was able to find the page and the transcript. Um, may I approach? Yes. Page, page 30. Although I think that the PDF of the transcript says each page is three. So it's page 30, um, starting at line 8, going to page... 31 uh, line 20, or sorry, line 24. So if you could start from there. And just look up when you're done, please.
second video is Harwick House main, main level. Third video is Harwick House upper level. Fourth video is Harwick House evidence. The fifth one is houses, aerial, and ring cams. And the last one is side-by-side -side comparison. All right. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask to play the Harwick lower level video clip. And these video clips are about under two minutes, I believe. Right. At least uh, the one I'm showing right now. Is this a video clip that's playing for the jury? Is this what you created? Yes. And is this created in the manner you described? Yes, it is. And so I noticed that you did not include trees. Were you asked to include trees when creating these models? No, I was not. I did not include trees or... <laughs> It's starting to feel like winter almost, isn't it? Uh, the people are prepared to call their next witness. They have Mr. Uh, Mendoza, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you may uh, ask Mr. Mendoza to step in. Mr. Mendoza, uh, Mendoza, if you could raise your right hand, please, my clerk here. You saw me state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause now pending before this court should be the truth. The whole truth is nothing but the truth to help you out. Thank you. Thank you. Please have a seat. Oh, is there a hearing aid for a witness? I don't know. Is there a hearing aid? Well, some type of hearing aid for the witness. I don't know if the court provides any. I, no, I don't have any. If we had advanced warning, I think we probably could have gotten some apparatus. Um, are you, you, are, you have difficulty hearing? I'm, I'm okay right now. Okay, if you if you need a question repeated, please don't hesitate, okay? Thank if you. we had advanced uh, notice, we probably would be able to get a, some kind of advice. But if you need a question repeated or you don't hear a comment, please let us know. All right? All right. You're going to be able to hear my questions, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, hold up. Go ahead. Please, please state and spell with your first and last name. Can you can you state uh, your first and last name and spell them both? Jorge Mendoza. All right. First name, J-O-R-G-E. Last name, M-E-N-D-O-Z-A. All right, uh, Mr. Is it obvious? You're gonna, yes. you're gonna. Okay, go ahead. Uh, please tell the jury what it is that you do for a living. I'm a forensic uh, animator. What does that mean? That means uh, I work with accident reconstructionists, and we recreate accidents, civil and uh, criminal cases. All right. Uh, can you describe your professional experience that has prepared you to do that type of work? Um, I graduated from the University of Texas El Paso with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. And I began working as an engineer for various uh, uh, organizations, Walkwell International and Never Air Station Alameda. What other experience do you have? As a mechanical engineer at uh, Never Air Station Alameda, I received extensive experience in mechanical design, engineering analysis, and 3D design drawing. When I was working there in 1992, uh, A6 Intruder was doing touch and goes at the base. It crashed into the bay killing both the pilot and the co-pilot. That was the very first uh, forensic animation I did. I built an accurate 3D model of the A6 intruder. <coughs> I built uh, reference models of the Naval Air Station, and then I worked with Naval investigators, and we recreated the flight path of that A6 intruder as it went over the base, lost control, and crashed into the San Francisco Bay. And did you create your own uh, company uh, back in 1993, Litigation Animation? A year after that uh, accident, I decided to form a company, and I called it Litigation Animation Incorporated. 
where we do forensic visualization throughout the country. What does that mean? Um, again, I work with various experts, biomechanicists, automotive engineers, train engineers, pilots, and I build models and I work with them and I take their analytical, analytical data and I create models so that the jury can understand their testimony. And what type of software would you use to create these 3D models? Um, I use 3D Studio Max, uh, 2D software, uh, Photoshop, and After Effects. Do you work with civil attorneys? Yes, I work with a variety of civil and criminal attorneys. You work with criminal defense attorneys? Criminal defense, uh, the last criminal defense attorney I worked with is uh, Phil Harney, and it, well, it was a, a case involving... This is irrelevant. Well, you can complete your answer. You can complete your answer. So uh, it was a, a case involving somebody... Well, I don't need to know what the case was, just that you worked with criminal, de criminal defense attorneys in the past. I do work with criminal defense attorneys. And in this particular case, were you asked uh, to create 3D models of 2086 Mound Street and 2080 Mound Street? Yes, I was. And was this request sometime around February 1st, 2023 of this year? Yes, it was. Uh, and were you provided with a video walkthrough of the property at 2086 Mound Street? Yes, I was uh, provided with various material, and one of, one of them was a video walkthrough. Were you provided with an LAPD laser scan of 2086 Mount Street, uh, dated April 14, 2020? I was provided with a laser scan. And what is that, when, uh, that laser scan? What, what is that exactly? A laser scan is a device that essentially will capture the 3D geometry of a surface. And to capture a house, usually you'll need four scans, you put one in the back of the house because you have four sides to the house in the back of the house, that'll capture all the surface geometry and then on the left side. So when you're done, you end up with four scans and you're able to connect them into a single point cloud which you can process in a 3D modeling program and create a, a surface model that can be presented to the jury for animation or visualization. Well, you're also provided with uh, crime scene photographs for 2086 Mountain Street. Yes, I was uh, provided with multiple crime scene photos of both properties at 2080 and 2086 Mount <coughs> Street. Uh, we provided a seven ring video camera showing uh, from 2080 Mount Street, certain ring cameras depicting what happened towards the back of the property and some depicting what's in front of the property. Yes, I received seven videos of ring cam for two cameras on 2080 Mount Street. Uh, we provided some preliminary police reports. I was provided with four investigative reports from the police. Were you provided with DMV photos for uh, defendant Garrett Purse House? Yes. And for Amy Harwick? Yes. You were not provided the autopsy report? I was not. Did you, on March 17, 2023, go to the location of 2080, the neighbor's house, Mount Street, and did you conduct a laser scan of that property? I did. Um, why did you do that? Excuse me? Why did you do that? Um, I did that because I needed to reconstruct the area where the, the ring cam video was. So I needed to build a computer model and I needed to locate the position where the ring cams were set up. So how would the laser scan help you, along with the photos, the crime scene photos, help you uh, determine where the, the location of the ring cameras? Using the photographs and the the evidence that I that I uh, captured with the laser scan, I was able to use the photographs and determine where the ring cams were, were placed on on the property, and they were placed on a pole, a couple of pole. one was placed on a pole, and the other one appeared to be placed on a fence. Okay. And now that you have the laser scan for 2086 Mount Street, and now and now you you've generated a laser scan for the neighbor's house, uh, were you able to create 3D models from this data along with the other information you had? Yes, and the way that process works, I take the laser scans, which consisted of, was 19 laser scans for the uh, 2086. I combined them into one, one uh, laser scan called the point cloud, brought them into a 3D modeling program, and from there I use the surface points, because it, it, it creates millions of digital points, and I'm able to connect those points and create surfaces and create uh, surface geometry and create a model. And did you create uh, various 3D models? I'm, so, I'm sorry, repeat that? Did you create various 3D models? Yes, it was various, various uh, 
models. And we, what was your objective in creating these 3D models? My objective was to help the jury understand the, where the le evidence was located relative to certain structures. Was it also to show how the buildings uh, related to each other, 2086 and 2080 Mound Street? Yes, when the two models were complete, you have, you're able to see the spatial relationships between the two houses and where the evidence was found in relationship to the inside or the outside of the house. Okay. Were you asked to make sure that the buildings, 2086 and 2080, that the building structure was to scale? Yes. Uh, now, you, were, you received crime scene photographs, correct? Yes. And in the crime scene photographs, you could see uh, portraits, furniture, plants, correct? Yes. Were you asked to place all those items to scale within the 3D model? No, I was not. And would that be an issue to do that to every single item that you see in, in, in a photograph? I'm sorry, repeat that? Would that create an issue for you to scale and create a picture in the 3D model of every single thing that you would see in a crime scene photograph? Yes, having put all the different elements that were in the house at 2086 would have been very distracting and would have taken away from uh, being able to see the relationship where the evidence was placed within the property or within the different rooms or in the patio. How much time would you have to spend if, for example, you had to scale a portrait that was in the living room? Or uh, let's say a plant. Let's say if there was a plant in the living room. To model to model every element of the house, and let's say a plant would take maybe uh, five to six hours. So your focus was uh, doing a 3D model of the general structures, uh, height of the various points in the buildings. Yes. You, you want to have in my hand a CD, and just remind people's next in order. 119. 119. And it has, and it has uh, six videos, uh, and they're labeled, the video one's labeled Harwick House Lower Level, the second video is Harwick House main, main Level, third video is Harwick House Upper Level, fourth video is Harwick House Evidence, the fifth one is Houses, Aerial, and Ring Camps, and the last one is Side-by-Side -side Comparison. Right. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask to play the Harwick lower level video clip. And these video clips are about under two minutes, I believe. Right. At least uh, the one I'm showing right now. Is this a video clip that's playing for the jury? Is this what you created? Yes. And is this created in the manner you described? Yes, it is. And so I noticed that you did not include trees. Were you asked to include trees when creating these models? No, I was not. I did not include trees or the ceiling. And this lower level, lower level floor plan, what's it supposed to show? It's, it's, right now it's basically rotating around so you can get a general description of the, the property and it'll dissolve into the lower, I guess it was an apartment that Amy had rented out and it shows you the layout of that apartment. Well, that part of the rented out, that would be stricken. Okay. okay. But you said it showed what appeared to be a, a, a separate apartment at, at the lower level. Yes. Right. And here it appears that you're identifying different sections of this lower level. Correct. And what are they? I believe this is a stairway. This is a bathroom. utility room bedroom okay okay and now let's go on to the next video clip and is this to scale by the way yes okay. I'm going to play highway house main level this is also about a two minute video clip And what are you trying to show with this video clip, uh, again, main level floor plan? Again, I'm trying to orientate the jury to the, the structure of the house and I'm rotating around so they can get a good look at it and then we'll dissolve, dissolve to the main level.
But how many hours does it take to create, like, for example, this mid-level uh, 3D model? It's an iterative process, kind of going back and forth, uh, building up on the structure. And the total time was approximately was 194 hours for the entire project. So this is not somewhere where you could just punch something into the software and it, and it comes up with a 3D model? No. Why would you say that? It, it, it takes a lot of back and forth, checking dimensions and putting up the surfaces and looking at photographs, looking at the laser scan, checking the points. There's a lot of checks. There's continually checks and balances. Okay. And so this shows the living room area, yes. the dining room area. And is this also to scale? Yes. Now the furniture that's in this depicted there, is that to scale? I'm sorry. Is, is the furniture that's depicted in this model, is that to scale? It, it is not. It's what I call a reference object, and it's placed there to help the jury understand where the evidence is located. So in its approximation of the geometry and the scale of the actual object. Okay. And But you have the photographs that's the actual evidence of where furniture may be located. I, yes. All right, let's go on to number, the third video, Harwick House Upper Level. And what were you trying to show with this video clip? Again, I'm trying to help the jury understand the general structure of the, uh, the property on 2086. So that's for the, that's why we have the rotation, and then we do, dissolve away so that we can show the upper level floor plan. And now, the balcony here is at this scale. It is. And did you focus to make sure that the balcony and its relationship to the ground was to scale? I did. And for example, the height of the railing. Did you try to make sure that that was to scale to the best of your ability? Yes. And how do you check measurements with it when you're doing these 3D models? How can someone check the measurement? You can trust the laser scan. Uh, the laser scan is very accurate to within a fraction of an inch. What do you mean by that? How's the laser scan so accurate? Well, I'm not exactly sure of the algorithm that's used within the laser scan, but it shoots out, if it was to scan this room, it shoots out a point and it'll catch that surface and it'll identify that point in three-dimensional space, but it shoots out millions and millions of points to identify the different surfaces. And as a modeler, I will come in and I will extract the surfaces of that wall over there and create a model, and begin building a model. And then you would know uh, almost any measurement related to that particular point. And they could be measured. All right, looking at the fourth video, how are we this is about five minute and what are you trying to show with this next video, Harwick uh, House Evidence? Uh, and I'll wait until we get the place for the journey. Now, it appears to be a walkthrough. I'm going to pause it here for a second. Now, now you're not trying to show any, anyone's particular walking speed or anything related to this case. You're just, is that correct? That's correct. The camera was not even placed at some high height. It was purposely placed probably about three feet. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't trying to mislead you and try to represent this is what it looked like to walk through this house. So it's, I, I believe it was around three feet from the ground. Okay, go ahead. And is this uh, video clip also to scale as far as the building? Yes. And will it show the general location of the various pieces of evidence? Yes. And you have the photographs also for this, for where these, this, these items of evidence were located. Right, we use the photographs to position the physical evidence within the different locations that were identified. right here. So uh, right now it's uh, showing number 14 uh, and on your 3D model is that the approximate location of where you would uh, find that particular item of evidence, uh, photo ID number 14 within the 3D model? 
So we have multiple photos of the evidence on that door and we use them to approximate the location and place our digital exhibit within our model. Go ahead. And would you request it to focus on uh, certain items of evidence? Yes. As far as this particular 3D model video? That's correct. Right now, two minutes and two seconds. Are you now in what's uh, uh, what looks like to be a TV room? Yes. Once again, the furniture here is just a reference object. Yes, reference objects. Now, when you may say reference object, do you try to make it? Similar to what you observed there as far as furniture? Yes, geometry is approximately center, but as you can see, I made all the same blue color. And then you uh, have photographs to show the location in the 3D model for particular pieces of evidence. I'm sorry, repeat that? On, in this 3D model, you have photographs showing various uh, crime scene photos and the location within the 3D model. That's correct. Now the bottle appears to be moving towards the bedroom on the third floor. That's right. Now, when you wrote red stain on doorknob, that was your interpretation of where the red stain was. That's correct. And so would this be to scale at the point that you're here in the balcony? The balcony is to scale. This, the video ends at about this point where it's from a view from the balcony looking down at the concrete patio. Yes. Right, thank you. Now I'm going to play the next fifth video clip labeled Houses, Aerial, and Ring Camera. This is also about, about a five minute video clip. <laughs> what are you trying to show with this video clip? Just identifying the, the two houses. And the distance between the two houses. So you can see the spatial relationships of the two geometries. And are these two buildings to scale within this video? They are to scale. 
And are you going to include the ring videos within this video? I believe so. So at minute one, there's the video, a ring video and a circle showing the location of that particular ring camera. Is that right? The, the white circle. Turn on the volume. It's blowing up. Can you tell us what is shown here at this point? At one yeah. little past one minute and twenty seconds. Can you tell us what is shown here? Right. So the the circle identifies the location where the where the photographs identify the, the ring cam and then that insert on the top right corner shows the video that was captured from that ring cam. So you were able to determine the location of the ring camera for the particular video clip. That's right. this point at one minute and two minutes and 13 seconds you're now on the third ring camera video at this location I believe so what's this video and these are video clips with a time of 2053 hours that's like 853 p.m. correct yes Deposit. Then you have a fourth video embedded into this 3D model with a time of 1.11 a.m., correct? Yes. And the location of that ring camera, you were able to determine it's, at that, it's on that post towards the back of the building. That's right. Lastly, uh, you were provided with DMV photos uh, for defendant Garrett Kershaus, showing his height and weight. Yes. And also a DMV photo for Ms. Uh, Amy Harwick with showing her height and weight. Yes, you did. Look at here at People's Next in Order, Your Honor, People's Number. You are at 120. 120? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Is this... Uh, the DMV photo you were provided with? Yes. And it shows her height as 5'5 five five and her weight at 118? That's right. Okay. And did you, using the information from the DMV photos, did you create uh, models of their bodies and put them side by side? Yes, I uh, took the, uh, the uh, evidence from the, uh, the driver's license and I created two models to show the height differential comparison between uh, Amy and, and Garrett. You can play that video clip from People's Exhibit number 119. <laughs> Can you tell us what are you trying to show with this video? Just trying to show the spatial difference between the two and their height differences. Did you also uh, create some 3D video stills? Yes, I created some stills. Your Honor, I have people's next in order, people's number 121. Yes. Three photographs, A to C. Looking here quickly. Is this a video still showing both locations, 2086 and 2080 Mount Street? Yes, I was probably. The backyard? Y yes, that's mine. And looking at photograph B, is this a they are still focusing on uh, 2086, the backyard and the concrete patio. Again, that's mine. That's what? That's one of mine. Okay. And is that to scale? It is. And looking at photograph C, does that show the back and a 
appears to show the third level without the roof. That's right. It shows the third level without the roof to scale. Thank you. And by the way, did you ha use it when when you went to laser scan uh, the property back in March of 2023? Did you use a drone at all? I did, but the data was not usable. Okay. Did you obtain any photographs from that drone? I may have, but I don't recollect. Okay. I have two aerial photographs. Would this be mark people's next in order? 122 A and B. Yes. You recognize what's shown there? Mm -hmm. That could be from the drone. Okay. You see that? Is that 20? Am I pointing to uh, to 2086 Mountain Street? Yes, 2086. That that's 2086, and that shows the balcony. And here I'm going to zoom. I'm going to show you another photograph with a zoomed in version B of the balcony. Do you see that there? Yeah, uh, I believe I I don't remember, but that. <coughs> If I'm the only one that took drone shots, that could be mine. Okay. Did you provide this uh, to the prosecution, if you know? I provided everything I had to the prosecution. Did you uh, recently provide drone uh, photographs? Uh, uh, say it again. Did you recently provide photographs from, from a drone to the prosecution? Mm -hmm. I don't remember when I provided them. Okay. Uh, but this, going back to photograph A, does it show like... This blue awning, you can't, can you even see it? Uh, is, the, is the blue awning, does it go under the balcony? Yes, the, the awning from this angle, you, you, can't, you can't see it. You can see the faces of the back, um, the back buildings, the back structure on 2086, but you cannot see the awning because it's hidden, it's being obstructed by the, uh, the balcony. Looking at Defense Exhibit ZZ7, this is a photograph of the awning, which is underneath the balcony. Yes, that the balcony, the, the balcony extends out further than the, the the awning. Now, on or about September twelfth, twenty twenty three. This month, did you create? Were you asked to create a slide, a still that had measurements uh, from the ground to the top of the balcony, uh, and to include a model of uh, uh, Miss uh, Harwick and also the height of the railing? Yes. Looking here at people's next in order, people's number 123. <clears throat> Is this the exhibit you created? This is an exhibit I created. Okay. And so letter A is for the height you had for Amy Harwood from the DMV photo, five foot five? Yes. So is that model there supposed to be five foot five? That, that model was also measured and determined to be five foot five inches. And then you had a measurement B of the height of the railing at three feet and six inches. Yes, I measured the, the railing to be three feet, six inches. And when you say you measure it, how are you measuring it? I have, if you can imagine, I have all these digital points are overlaid right on top of this surface model. So I'm able to actually measure, I have a choice to measure from the point cloud or from my model, so I do both. And that's how you come up with? Yeah. And then you have letter C, which is top of the balcony rail all the way to the ground at 21 feet and one inch. Right, and, and again, I use the same te uh, technique to, to uh, make that measurement. And this was created uh, sometime around 9, September 12, 2023. Yes. And did you, did you make copies so they could be provided to both uh, the defense and the people? I do not remember. But you provide them to the prosecution. I did. Did were you then requested to make another three D slide showing an additional measurement of the ground to the floor of the balcony? Yes. 
And did you do that on or about September 17th, 2023? Yes. People's next in order number 124? Yes. Is this the still that you created with an additional measurement uh, of D from the floor to the balcony floor? Yes, this is, a, this is another exhibit I created showing the dimension from the bottom of the balcony to the surface of the patio. Now, sometime in August of 2023, did you receive a report uh, from a uh, Robert Malik? I did. And after that report, were you asked to make sure that the awning was actually to scale? Yes, I had to make some corrections to the awning because it was not to, it was not to the correct scale. Was it a reference object before you read that report? That is correct. It was a reference object. Okay. Had anybody ever had anybody asked you to make that to scale at any point before you read that report? No. So once you read that report, you made it to scale. That's right. Did it change much in when you would see it? Okay. Not. Well, in appearance, did it did it appear to change much? It it did it 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 brought the awning into proper geometry uh, scale and geometry so it, it basically put it where it, where it should have been which was um, uh, kind of under the awning uh, under the balcony so so after you fixed it it was it was more under the awning now yeah it was a correct correct scale I corrected the scale and after that uh, in that report, did you uh, notice an incorrect measurement for the ground to the floor of the balcony? Yes, I did. I noticed that uh, the expert had... Well, I don't want to get into that. Just did you notice an incorrect measurement? Yes, I did. And is that when you created this video still, uh, people's number 124? That's correct. And we then requested to make some more video stills focusing on the awning. And I have here people's next in order three photographs, A through C. 25. We're going to photograph 125A. Can you tell us what is shown here? So after, <coughs> so after I corrected the scale on the awning, um, I provided the the prosecution with some dimensions of the awning relative to the balcony. And prior to that, that report from that expert, you didn't believe, nobody told you that the awning was an issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, is an issue, I, I, I well, will sustain it with respect to that. Okay. Prior to you reading that report, uh, no one had asked you to scale uh, the awning. Asked and answered. Well, he, he didn't answer. Uh, did, nope. did anyone uh, ask you that question, sir? No. Okay. And so this is a, a, a view of looking straight to the back of the house and showing the balcony, is that correct? That's right. And it shows that the awning is about 13 feet and 4 inches in length? That's correct. What does it show here as far as, does this show, what's this measurement, one foot and six inches, what's that supposed to show? That shows the, that shows the, the distance, vertical distance from the, the bottom of the balcony to the, the lower edge of the awning. Looking at photograph B, can you tell us what you're showing here? Okay, this is a side view of the property and it shows how far the, uh, the patio extends out by two feet, two inches and it shows that the awning only sticks out one foot, approximately a foot. In photograph C. This shows the relationship between how far the awning sticks out and how far the, uh, uh, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the balcony sticks out. Yeah, one foot, one, two inches. Okay, so. It's about a foot and two inches to, from, uh, to 
to the awning, which is closest to the, the wall of the house? No, no. This is this is the relationship. The awning sticks out um, one foot from the house. So from that one foot, measuring from the tip of the awning to the end of the balcony, it's one foot, two inches. Okay, thank you. So that's how much more the, the balcony sticks out. And about how many hours have you spent creating these 3D models and stills? Approximately 194 hours. And you use software to do this? I use a variety of software. Three Studio Max, After Effects, Adobe Photoshop, um, and uh, and some other programs. You have computers running to create these models. Yes. In order to, after we connect and create all the surfaces and add all the textures that we need, we do a process that's called rendering, just like a, a, an artistic rendering. But it it renders a surface, and it takes it could take up to forty hours to render go through one rendering cycle. So all these models have to be rendered? Yes, they all have to be rendered. So you indicated you dedicated 194 hours, and how much do you charge per hour? Um, I, I believe it's $350 an hour. Okay, so your total, uh, the total amount that you're going to be requesting in this case based on the 194 hours, is that close to 68000 for these three? Yes, models? it's 68 k And that includes the laser scan and everything you did? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mendoza. Good afternoon. The $68,000 that you are billing, does that include your testimony? No. Does that include your travel? No, it does not. So you've traveled here from San Jose? That's correct. And are you going to be billing for your travel and your testimony as yes. well? Yes. And how much do you charge for, for for your testimony? Is it an hourly rate? No, uh, I, I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple thousand dollars a day for testimony. I, you know. Plus travel. Five hundred dollars. And are you just here for the day, or are you staying over? I'm not sure what's going to happen today. All right, so if you have accommodations, that will also could, be Could you speak up? Yes. If you have also accommodations to stay here overnight, will that be billed? I don't. You don't bill for that? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I do. Okay. Now, you indicated that you went to the location of 2080 Mound and 2086 Mound on the same day. Is that correct? That's right. And on that date, uh, you, you uh, acquired some drone data. Yes. Do you remember what that date was exactly? I'm sorry, repeat that. Do you know what date that was? I, I believe it was March 17th. Do you know what day of the week that was? Got your relevance? Uh, oh, I'll give it a little bit of Would it refresh your recollection to look at a calendar? Yeah, you can tell me. I, I don't. Would it be Friday? Uh -huh. Friday? I don't remember. Uh, Mr. Avila asked you about having to um, correct the scale of the awning. Do you recall being asked that? I'm not object. Ms. Stacey's testimony, you did not correct the scale of the awning. All right, let's rephrase the question. I believe you used the word correct. Is that right? When you talked about changing the shape of the awning in your diagrams, was that a correction? I wouldn't call it correction because that we deliberately made that into a reference object, which was an approximation of the actual awning. So you took an approximation and you changed it to make it conform with the scale of the awning. Is that correct? I used a laser scan in order to um, adjust the scale of the awning with the actual awning and using the laser scan. So that was to make it the scale? Yeah. Okay.
I need just a moment, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me, Your Honor? Yes. Is it possible to get some water? Uh, let me see. Can we get some water, please? We'll, we'll see if we can. Can we, can we have some? Chair or on the bottom shelf? Okay, we'll get you some. Thank you, right. Yeah. Excuse me? Sorry, you have your water bottle there, don't you? On. Oh, okay. I was going to say when he comes, you could swap that, but okay. You know, Friday's a holiday, right? You all know that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I'm not sure which holiday it is. <laughs> but what is Friday, anyway? What, what holiday is Friday? Oh, it is Indigenous People Day. There you go. Pure vodka. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I found what I was looking for. I have uh, a rendering from uh, a video prepared by Mr. Mendoza. May it be marked defense next in order? You're at uh, triple C, uh, yes. Mr. Mendoza, do you recognize this rendering of the property at 2086 Mound? Yes, it is. Was this the original version uh, that you created before you changed the awnings and made them to scale? Yes, if you look at the awning, you could see that it's sticking out considerably further than the the adjusted version. And so after uh, after you correct, or after you changed the awning to scale, the awnings actually were recessed beneath the balcony, is that correct? Could you repeat that? After you changed this rendering of the awning to make it to scale, the awning was actually um, retracted beneath the balcony. It no longer extended beyond the balcony. That's right. And Mr. Avila asked you about um, the reason why you removed, uh, or you did not, let me rephrase that. Mr. Avila asked you why you did not include things like trees outside the properties of 2086 and 2080 Mound. Is that correct? You're, could you repeat that? Restate it. Okay. Mr. Avila asked you about your reasons why you did not include trees and other foliage surrounding the properties at 2086 and 2080 Mound. Do you recall being asked that? No. You don't remember him asking you about that? No. Do you remember him asking you about plants? We, we had a discussion about how much detail we were going to add to the model and how much that was going to affect the cost of the project, and it was cost prohibitive to add all that detail. Okay, are you talking about inside the house? You mentioned plants and trees? Yes. yes. So I, a combination of both. Okay. Your Honor, I have a series of three pho photographs I'd like to be marked defense. Uh, uh, triple D, one through three, how's that? Triple D, one through three. Yes. I'm going to show you triple D1. 
does this appear to be the front of 2086 Mount Street? This is 2086 Mount Street. Showing you triple D2. Is this the rear of 2086 Mount Street next door and at the, in the at upper right of the, uh, well, the, you can see the blue awnings on a structure in this photograph, is that correct? Uh, this Photoshop, uh, this photograph shows both properties in the rear, 2086 and 2080, 2080 being on the left. Okay, and is this from your drone footage? Yes. And this was taken the same day as um, your inspection of 2080 Mount Street? Yes, March 17th. 2023? Yes, 2023. And then the last photograph in this series, Triple D3. Is this the, um, an aerial photograph or an aerial still of drone footage you took of 2080 Mount Street? Yes. Do you know what type of equipment the LAPD used when they created the 3D scan that you relied upon? Not off the top of my head. I believe it was, uh, was it a Leica. I believe it was a Leica. How do you know how to spell that? L-I-C-A. What? No, that's not correct. No, I do. <coughs> so it was, but it was Leica. You just don't yeah, know how was, to spell it. I believe it was Leica. And was Detective Carranza present with you at 2080 Mount Street when you did your uh, work there? Yes, he was. Did you make contact with anybody uh, at 2086 Mount Street? No. Did you go on the premises at 2086 Mount Street? I did not. And I noticed uh, when you were going through the demonstrative evidence, specifically <coughs> specifically the um, The upper level in the Harwick house, yeah. there was, you know, most of the time you would show a particular piece of evidence and then include a photograph that LAPD created of the actual evidence as it was photographed by LAPD. Is that correct? That's correct. I noticed, though, that when there was a portion of the demonstrative video, that indicated beads, there was no matching LAPD photograph. You'd have to show me that exhibit so I can confirm that. Okay. But we did have photographs showing the beads on the floor. Um, while they're they're looking for that video, um, 
you indicated that you did not receive, <coughs> excuse me, you did not receive uh, the coroner's report. I did not receive the coroner's report. So when you created your models, um, you did not have coroner's information about Amy Harwick's actual weight, correct? What was the last word? You did not have the coroner's information for Amy Harwick's actual weight, correct? That, that's right. Okay, we were able to find that location. Okay. Showing, showing your people. Exactly. Uh, people's 119. That minute. 119. Uh, and the video is the Harwick House evidence at 3 minutes and 34 seconds. All right. Uh, and could you just play it briefly just to see that no photograph? Fine, thank you. So you did not have a photograph to match the location of beads that you depict in this video, is that correct? Uh, beads or a bead? <coughs> beads? No, plural? Need to back up. I'm sorry, did you hear the question, sir? I was, no, she's just going to back up the video. Okay. Do you want it to start before the word bead? No, just to show the, the exhibit. Oh, they're right there. Um, that's not true. I actually, I did, even though I did not include the photograph that showed the beads on the floor, we did have b photographs that showed where the beads were kind of strewn about the floor. And uh, you had to look hard into the photo to, to see them, but they were there within the photo. But I did not include them in the exhibit. And the reason I did include them because the LAPD did not mark them as evidence. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. Any questions? Thank you, sir. You may step down. <coughs> People? The people call Mr. All right, Mr. Broderick, if you could approach the witness stand here, please. You can raise your right hand, face my clerk. You solemnly state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause not pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall not be done? Yes. Thank you. Let's have a seat. Please state and spell both your first and last name. Robert Broderick, R-O-B-E-R-T-B-R-O-D-E-R-I-C-K. All right, counsel. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. What do you do for a living? I'm employed by the Los Angeles Police Department as a criminalist. I'm currently assigned to the serology DNA unit. And what are your duties as a criminalist? Primarily uh, DNA analysis. And what is your background, training, experience that qualifies you to be a criminalist? Prior to being hired as a criminalist, I obtained a bachelor's degree of the, which covered the required casework, coursework. Also before I was hired, I took and passed a written test. After being hired, I underwent a training program, which consisted of reviewing relevant scientific literature, 
observing experienced criminalists performing their duties, practicing analysis on mock evidence. Prior to beginning casework, I underwent and passed a a prof uh, I'm sorry, a competency <laughs> test. <laughs> sorry, competency test. I'm currently undergo proficiency testing twice a year. I undergo annual continuing education classes, and I'm certified by the American Board of Criminalistics and Molecular Biology. Now we have a bit of a weak mic, so if you mind just speaking directly into the mics to make sure the jurors can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, as part of your duties as a criminalist, you talked about conducting DNA analysis. Uh, do you interpret DNA data? Yes, ma'am. Do you also analyze and compare data and prepare reports during your uh, coursework? Yes, I do. And do you conduct analytical review of other analysts' casework? Yes. Now, have you ever testified before? Yes, I have. About how many times? Approximately 50 to 60 times. Now, is your laboratory accredited? Yes, it is. Are there certain requirements that must be met by the lab in order to achieve accreditation? Yes, there are. And are those the FBI quality assurance standards? Yes, we're also accredited by um, ISO 17025 uh, accrediting standard. Are there standard DNA testing methods and protocols used for DNA analysis? Yes, there are. Are these standard methods and testing procedures used throughout the country? Maybe not the exact ones, but very similar ones. And does your lab have standard operating procedures related to DNA testing? Yes, we do. Do these standard operating procedures comply with the FBI quality assurance standards for forensic testing? Yes. What type of DNA testing does your lab perform? I perform standard um, short tandem repeat DNA testing. Is that commonly known as STR testing? Yes, it is. Is this the current state of the art for forensic use in the country? Yes. Now, what is DNA? D DNA is a collection of large molecules that exist in all of our cells in our body with the exception of red blood cells. They contain the information that we need in order to live. They give us our biological characteristics that we're able to survive and they make us who we are. Our DNA makes us us, a tree's DNA makes it a tree, and so on. Is DNA the same in every cell in someone's body? Yes. With the exception of identical twins, is each person's DNA unique? It could be considered unique. Does a person's DNA change throughout their lifetime? No, it does not. Now, what is a DNA profile? A DNA profile is are the genetic markers that we're looking for on a person's DNA, and those genetic markers can, can um, are what make up the profile. What do you do after you obtain a DNA profile? There's a few things we can do with it. We can um, compare it to another person. Um, we could possibly upload that profile to CODIS, which is a, a DNA database that's used to identify people. Um, it depends on what the specific needs of that investigation are. Can you use DNA to exclude people? Yes. Can you use DNA to include people? Yes. You stated that when you obtain a DNA profile, um, there's a multitude of things that you can do. Can you also compare evidence samples to reference samples? Yes. And what is a reference sample? A reference sample is a DNA profile obtained from a known source. And what type of samples are used to obtain a DNA reference sample? Usually oral swabs, but they can also be um, blood as well. Blood can be drawn from a person and that blood can be used as a reference sample material as well. Can you briefly describe the process of DNA analysis? During DNA ana analysis there are several steps that the sample will undergo. One is extraction, which is consists of breaking the cell open and breaking the nucleus of the cell open, which is where the DNA is. 
so that can be liberated. Once that's done, it goes through a um, cleanup process to remove all the extraneous material um, from the DNA, so it can be purified. Once that occurs, we will then measure how much DNA is present in that sample, so we can know whether we have enough to even continue our analysis with. After that, if there's enough DNA, we will amplify the DNA, DNA amplification, which consists of making molecular copies of the genetic markers that we're interested in, in looking at. After that, it goes to a separation process, and ultimately, we get a visualization on, a, on an electropherogram, and that will, that's what we use to ultimately compare profiles. Now, is there interpretation of this data? Yes, there is. Now, at some point during the interpretation step of the DNA analysis process, are you aided by a computer software uh, program known as STRMix? Yes. And how does that work? Uh, STRMix, commonly referred to as StarMix, is a computer program that is a tool for us and assists us in determining what the DNA profile from the data we have is. Do you input that data I'm so, um, into the STRMix program? Yes, we have an electronic copy of the data that we obtain from our instrumentation that gets imported into the computer software. And do you conduct the same sort of review um, for the electropherogram for every sample that you analyze? I'm sorry, can you repeat that please? Do you conduct the same review through the STR mix that you do for each sample? Yes, every sample that we enter into the STR mix, we, we do review. Does the STR mix provide statistical weight for DNA data? It can be used to perform statistical analysis on a sample, yes. What is a likelihood ratio? A likelihood ratio is a ratio of two probabilities. Um, the ratio of something Usually we set up a hypothesis that this DNA profile came from a person of interest versus it coming from an unknown individual. If the likelihood of, if the probability that, that this DNA profile came from a person of interest is greater than coming from an unknown individual, and we can, that will give us a, a likelihood ratio. So what is the purpose of providing a statistical, a statistical weight to the data? So that we can help us, the likelihood ratio tells us how likely it is to have or originated from a person of interest or from, a, from an unknown person. Now is a lab report generated after the data is run through the STR mix program? Yes. Um, are controls used to ensure that there's reliable and accurate results obtained? Yes. And what are those um, safeguards that are used in order, in order to ensure that there are accuracy and reliability? Once we run a profile through StarMix, we, and it's, we call it deconvoluted. Once it's deconvoluted and we have the profile or the profiles that were obtained from that DNA profile from that, or it may even be a, a mixture of more than one person. It may, have, it may be from one person or maybe from multiple people. We will review the profile that StarMix has created to the electropherogram that we have to see if it makes sense and that we agree with the re StarMix results. Does one analyst carry out all the steps of DNA testing that you just talked about? Usually not. Does the DNA lab that you are employed by, the LAPD lab, employ something called batch processing? Yes. At each stage of batch processing, do the analysts write, record, or otherwise document data near or at the time of the event? Yes, contemporaneously. And are these records kept at the laboratory in the ordinary course of, of business? Yes, they are. Now, 
taking you to this specific case, did you receive items to analyze under DR number 20060620? Yes, I analyzed data under that DR number. Now, were the evidence items that you analyzed the following? A reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House, a swab of red stain from French doors in living room, swab of red stain from floor, another swab of red stain from French doors in living room, as well as a swab of red stain from French doors in bedroom. Yes, those are the items I analyzed. And did you conduct an analysis of those items of evidence sometime between February 16th and February 18th of 2020? Yes. What kind of testing was performed on these items? Uh, short tandem repeat or STR testing. Did you prepare, I'm sorry, did you prepare a report in this case that, result, um, that reflects the results of your testing? Yes, I did. In addition to your report, is there a case file? Yes, there is. And does that case file outline all the steps that were taken for DNA analysis that you described as part of the st standard operating procedures and protocols followed by your laboratory? Yes. And do you have a copy with you? I do. And is it standard practice in your crime lab to prepare a report describing the test results, including that that is in the case file? Yes. And that's for every single case? Correct. And those reports in the case file accurately reflect the results of testing performed by each of the analysts in batch processing, is that correct? Yes. Now, were any of the items that I talked to you about or referenced in that were booked under 2006-06220, was there any screening tests conducted on any of those items? Yes, there was. And why was there a screening test that was performed on these items? They were described as red stains and a presumptive test for blood was conducted on those four samples. Now, just as a uh, general question, is it practice, common practice by your lab to be able to test samples or swabs for urine? No. So you're able to make determinations as to biological fluids for items of evidence that come into your lab. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You're able to test for biological fluids that on items of evidence that come into your lab. Is that correct? Yes, we do, for some biological fluids. And when you say some biological fluids, that includes um, blood. Is that correct? Yes. Or semen? Yes. However, your lab does not test for urine. Is that correct? We do not. Now, you um, indicated that the screening analysis indicated that there were certain items of evidence that you referenced that tested positive for blood. Correct. And why is it that you conduct a screening analysis during this um, DNA analysis of these items? When we have a swab that's described as a swab of a red stain, we don't, we don't know what that red stain is. Maybe ketchup. So we conduct a preliminary test for blood in the laboratory to test to see if it could be blood. If it's positive, then it warrants further investigation as being blood. Now, seeing that the swabs of red stains came back positive for blood, did those swabs then proceed to DNA analysis? Yes, because they tested positive with our presumptive test for blood, they did go on to DNA testing. Now, I know you said you conducted a screening test for each swab indicating posi a positive result for blood. Was there some sort of analysis also conducted on the reference buccal swab from Gareth Purse House? There was DNA testing conducted on it, but there was no preliminary testing done on it. So just a DNA analysis of the reference buccal swab? Yes, because it was a reference sample. Were there DNA profiles obtained from the items of evidence? Yes, from all five. Was there any sort of combination of DNA present in any of those samples or swabs? 
all the samples resulted in single source DNA profiles. Meaning there was only one DNA profile present in each of the items of evidence that we're talking about here. That's correct. What were the results of your DNA analysis of the initial swab of red stain from the French doors in the living room? Both of those were single source male profiles. I compared those to the DNA profile recovered from the reference sample of Gareth Pert's house and they matched. So you, you're talking about both of the swab of red stains from the French doors in the living room. There were two, is that correct? Yes. And you conducted a, um, a developed a DNA profile from both of those stains? Yes. And you said from both of those stains, there was a, I'm sorry, could you repeat the comparison to that of the reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House? Both of those samples, both of those single source DNA profiles were compared to the reference sample obtained from Purse House. And what was the result? The DNA profiles from both of the red stains matched the DNA profile obtained from Purse House. And did you do a frequency occurrence estimate of the profiles? Yes, a likelihood ratio was calculated. And what is that likelihood ratio? So the likelihood ratio, it's at least one septillion, which is uh, one with 24 zeros behind it, one septillion times more likely that those DNA profiles obtained from the red stains originated from Garrett Purse House as opposed to an unknown individual. That's one with 24 zeros after it? One with 24 zeros behind it. Now, did you also do a comparison between the DNA profile developed from the red stain from the floor to that of the reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House? Yes, I did. And what were the results of that DNA analysis? The results were the same. Was the same likelihood ratio also um, concluded by you? Yes, I concluded the likelihood ratio was the same. And the likelihood ratio of the match of the DNA profile from the red stain from the floor? and that of the reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House is again, one in septillion? At least one septillion times greater that that originated from Purse House as opposed to a unknown. And person. what was the results of your DNA comparison to the swab of red stain from the French doors in the bedroom to that of the reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House? That sample resulted in a single source DNA profile from an unknown female. So the, your DNA analysis of the swab of the red stain from the French door in the bedroom came back to the DNA profile of a female with an unknown source at this time. Yes. Now you didn't have a reference sample to compare that female DNA profile to anything, is that correct? <laughs> no, the only, I only had one DNA reference sample. And that was belonging to Gareth Purse House. Correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Cross examination. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> so I want to back up for just a moment. You said there are essentially four steps in DNA analysis, correct? Uh, approximately. I mean, generally four. Okay. And in this case, did you do any? of the initial three, the extraction, quantification, or amplification? I did not. Were you present when those steps were completed? No, I wasn't. Okay, so you can't testify determinatively that the analysts who performed those steps followed the policies in place? I wasn't there when they were doing the work. So with regard to StarMix, uh, it's a probabilistic genotyping software, correct? Correct. And essentially what it does is there's some statistical principles underlying it that try and, I don't want to say guess, but come up with the best estimation of what genetic profiles are present in a sample. Yes, it helps us determine a genetic profile. Okay. And initially StarMix was primarily being used for mixtures, correct? It can be used for mixtures and it can also be used for single source profiles. And single source profiles prior to StarMix were manually deconvoluted? Correct. 
And that essentially means you're going in uh, with the naked eye, you're looking at what alleles are present at different loci and determining what genetic profile is there. Yes, exactly. And when you do random match probability, you also end up with a statistic, correct? Yes, random match probability is a, is a statistical analysis. And that essentially tells you that if you were to pick a random person out of the population, it tells you how probable it is that they would share the same DNA profile as the person. Uh, I think you refer to them as the point of interest? The random match probability tells us um, approximately how many times that DNA profile occurs in the general population. Okay, and that's, uh, that's different than a likelihood ratio. It is. And with a likelihood ratio, what happens is the analyst who's doing the examination inputs two hypotheticals. That's correct. And in this case, or I guess most criminal cases, the hypothesis is that the DNA profile came from a point of interest or from an unknown individual. Yes, uh, that it came from a person of interest. Okay. And when you're getting a likelihood ratio, that statistic is only contemplating those two hypotheticals, correct? The, the hypothesis is that this profile originated from a person of interest over a unknown individual compared to an unknown individual. So, and those are the only two hypotheses being examined, correct? For a single source profile. For... for Mixtures becomes more complicated, but for the calculation that, that was performed in this scenario, um, that was a hypothesis. Person of interest over an unknown individual. Okay. And LAPD lab protocol actually doesn't allow a likelihood ratio to be referred to as a match, correct? Yes. I, I wouldn't refer to a likelihood ratio as a match, but I could look at uh, when I say match, I meant electropharogram. The genetic profiles visually are a match. Okay, and so when you're talking about the electropharogram, it's essentially a chart that shows um, the different loci on a gene. Yes, the various genetic markers that and can compose that DNA profile. Okay, so if you think of a chromosome as a street, would it be fair to say that the loci are houses that you're looking at? Like specific addresses, sure. Yes, and then within each house, you're looking at alleles, which are the genes that are present. Uh, not the genes, but genetic markers. So it would be the, the alleles that are present, one from mom, one from dad. Yes. And that's how we determine someone's individual genetic profile. Correct. So in this case, the match did not come from star mix. The match came from you visually looking at the electropharograms. Yes, I looked at the electropharograms and was able to determine that they, that they matched the same genetic profile. Then I utilized star mix to calculate a likelihood ratio. Okay, so when speaking about this sample, you determined there's a match just to clarify, the software did not determine it was a match. No. No further questions. Hey. No, you're on. All right, you may step down. Good time to take a break, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take 15 minutes. Go up, please. Back on the record uh, in this matter of uh, people you may call your next witness. People call. Well, Your Honor, we have a oh, a stipulation. I forgot about that. Yeah, you you would call what the stipulation is, all of you. Yes. Okay. We have another stipulation here. Mr. Avila is going to read it to you at this time. <clears throat> uh, the people in the defense will stipulate to the following: that Deputy Rick Velasquez would be duly sworn and testify that he's an inmate. Video Visitation Systems Project Manager with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and a qualified custodian of records for Twin Towers Correctional Facility. 
He would further testify that he obtained the jail visitation records for defendant Garrett Kershouse, inmate number 5879433, People's Exhibit number 127, four, uh, four page document with pages A through D, title Visitation Activity Report. That People's Exhibit number 127 is a copy of the visitation records which is kept in the normal course of business for the correctional facility and are created contemporaneously with the jail visitation. The records accurately show the date and time of a visitation and the name of the visitor. The records show the approximate length of time of the visitation. Visitation from non-attorney visitors are videotaped. Select videotape visitations were provided to the investigators in this case. Does counsel so stipulate? Stipulated. Thank you. People stipulated as well? Yes. And I take 126 was the stip? One, uh, yes, 126 could be the stipulation. Oh, uh, yes, all right. Very good. Mark. All right, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Ms. Lisa Schliebe. All right, if you could raise your right hand, please. If you solemnly state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause now pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please state and spell both your first and last name. Lisa Schliebe, L-I-S-A-S-C-H-L-I-E-B-E. All right, Ms. Mariano. What do you do for a living? I'm a criminalist for the Los Angeles Police Department. And how long have you been a criminalist? Uh, about 14 and a half years. And what are your duties as a criminalist? As a criminalist, I am charged with uh, collecting evidence at crime scenes as necessary, um, as well as taking evidence that has been booked into our laboratory into um, possession in the serology DNA unit and processing that for um, DNA analysis and then making a report and coming to court and testifying to the results. What's your education, background, and training in regards to uh, being a criminalist? Um, I have a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in biology. I have a Master of Science in Criminal Justice from East Carolina University. And I have a Master of Science in Criminalistics from the California State University at Los Angeles. Um, during the time that I've been employed with the Los Angeles Police Department, I have been trained both internally in the identification of biological fluids, um, common examples being blood, saliva, semen, um, as well as completing their DNA Academy, which included mock casework, just like we would experience in, in real casework, and um, competency exams, as well as a final exam. Since then, I've also completed continuing education each year. I have attended conferences as a part of the Criminal California Association of Criminalists, and I complete two proficiency tests each year, um, both including biological screening and DNA. Now, how many times have you testified prior to today? Approximately 20. Now, did you receive items of evidence booked under DR number 20060620 to perform testing on in this case? I did. Specifically, did you perform testing on the following items? I'm just going to name them. And you could say yes or no after each item. Swab of stain on bedroom floor. Uh, can you tell me the item number? Sure. Item number one, swab of stain on bedroom floor. I'm sorry, item 39, swab of stain on bedroom floor. Yes. Item 40, swab of stain on bedroom floor. Yes. Item 57, reference blood sample from Amy Harwick. Yes. Item 58, a sexual assault evidence kit collected from Amy Harwick. Yes. Item 58, again, limb 711, a vaginal swab. Yes. And before I name the other items, the uh, following items I'm, I'm going to name are part of the sexual evidence kit collected from Amy Harwick. Is that correct? The, the list... 
Can I, may I see what you're referring to? Sure. So that there are several swabs that were included inside the sexual evidence assault kit. Is that correct? Correct. And you analyzed those specific swabs. Correct. Are those items the following? A vaginal swab? Yes. A cervical swab? Yes. An anal opening swab? Yes. A rectal swab? Yes. An external genital swab? Yes. An oral swab? Yes. A left neck swab? Yes. A right neck swab? Yes. Left breast swab? Yes. And right breast swab? Yes. Now, did you also examine an item reference sample, item number one, a buccal sample from Gareth Purse House? Yes. Was that previously analyzed by a different analyst or was that analyzed by you? It was previously analyzed by a fellow criminalist. Did you conduct testing on that particular item of evidence that was previously analyzed? No. Was that because it was already done by someone else? Correct. Did you prepare a report that reflects your findings in regards to your analysis of all the items I mentioned to you? Yes. And did you also have a case file that corresponds with all of the analysis that was conducted in regards to these items? Yes. And were these reports prepared at or near the time of actual testing? Yes. And in this instance, was the analysis of these items conducted sometime between April 8th, 2020 and June 9th, 2020? Yes. And do these reports accurately reflect the results of the testing as well as the procedures and protocols that were followed? Yes. Now I wanna to talk to you about whether any DNA profiles were obtained from the evidence samples and the reference samples in this case. Now, earlier the jury had heard what a reference sample is. That is, um, a DNA profile is obtained from a known, a known source. Is that correct? Correct. And so you had already a reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House in this instance. Is that correct? Correct. And a DNA profile had already been obtained from that specific sample? Correct. But you use that as a to com um, conduct a comparison in this instance, is that correct? Correct. Now there's also a reference blood sample from Amy Harwick, is that correct? Correct. Did you obtain a DNA profile from that reference blood sample from Amy Harwick? Yes. Now using the DNA profiles from the buccal sample belonging to Gareth Burr's house and the blood sample or the DNA profile obtained from the blood sample from Amy Harwick, were either of those DNA profiles present in either of the swabs of the stain on the bedroom floor? Amy Harwick was included as a minor contributor in one of the swabs. And what does a minor contributor mean? And so in a, in a mixture, there can be um, what we call a major and a minor, being the, the ma majority of the DNA that's present comes from that, that main donor, that, that major donor. And then the minor is some of the underlying DNA that's, that's below it. It could be background, it could be an, an actual mixture of fluid. There's a lot of um, things that can, that can have that happen. Now, was the DNA profile that was developed from the buccal sample of Gareth Purse House, was that excluded from the stains, the two swab of stains on the bedroom floor? Yes. Did you obtain any DNA profiles from any of the swabs contained in the sexual assault kit um, of Amy Harwick? No. Now earlier you had testified that you obtained um, a DNA profile from the reference blood sample of Amy Harwick and that there was already a DNA profile that was developed from the reference buccal sample belonging to Gareth Purse House. Is it customary within your lab for other criminalists to use DNA profiles that have been obtained uh, during a prior analysis? Yes. Thank you, nothing further. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. So when we're talking about the analysis that's done on the swabs that you just mentioned, 
um, it's differential extraction, correct? Correct. And that means that you're separating out male and female DNA. I'm, the point of a differential extraction is to separate the sperm cells from non-sperm cells, not necessarily male from female. And so when you're looking at the sperm cells, you would then be looking at YSTR if it's present? Um, I am not trained in YSTRs. I am only trained in the common uh, forensic analysis of STR. Okay, so you would just be looking at the standard profile that's present, not the male profile found in YSTR? Correct. And in this case, on the um, vaginal, cervical, um, anal, rectal, and external genital swabs, there was in fact no male DNA detected, correct? Um, may I refer to my report? Would it refresh your recollection? Yes, it would. With the court's permission? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, and that would be limb 711, 731, uh, 751, and 771? Uh, yes, they, there's no male detected on those. Oh, no, sorry, no spermatozoa would detect it on those. Okay, and then the two stains from the bedroom floor, was there any serology testing done on those? Um, there's not traditional serology testing done um, prior to, during uh, the extraction process, because this is a differential and we are separating the sperm from the non-sperm cells. During that process, there is a time that the analyst will identify whether spermatozoa are present or not, and that is the level of serology screening for, for this. And in those two samples, there was sperm detected, correct? Correct. And I'm sorry, did you say it was a three-person or two-person mixture? I, the bed, one of the stains on the bedroom floor was um, single source and the other stain was a three-person mixture. Okay, and the single source on the stain, Mr. Pershouse was excluded from that, correct? Correct. Which means that his DNA profile was not present? Correct. And that was the same with the other stain on the bedroom floor? Correct. And with those stains, you said there was one male present in both samples? Correct. And in fact, that male profile was uploaded to CODIS? It was. And can you explain for the jury what CODIS is? Um, so CODIS is a nationwide database um, and that is used not just for um, criminal cases but also for missing persons. It can be used um, and for um, identifying, let me say, mass, uh, mass fatality issues. Um, so in this situation, we know that a crime has been committed and we are unaware of who may have been present. So we will upload within certain guidelines that the FBI has provided for us, um, upload those profiles in an attempt to identify either that individual or um, to match to another case. Um, it's, it's really meant just to be an investigative lead to try to give the investigators somewhere to, to look. And one of the requirements, um, one of the federal requirements for upload to CODIS is that it belongs. Uh, I'll allow the question. Um, that it belonged to a putative perpetrator, correct? Correct. And that means that it would have to belong to somebody, uh, there's a belief could be a suspect in the crime. Objection relevance. Sustained at this point, the way the question is phrased. What is a putative suspect? A putative Sustained. Your Honor, can we approach? Yes. for the jury what a putative suspect is? A putative suspect would be just an individual that may have been present um, either during the commission of the crime um, or at that scene while um, an event was occurring. 
Okay. And just to clarify the timeline, this sample was uploaded after you had found that Mr. Purse House was excluded from that sample. <coughs> Correct. No further questions. Any? No, nothing really. All right. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. You may call your next witness. The people call Samuel Hong. What's the name? Samuel Hong. All right. If you get the approach the witness stand here, please. And uh, raise your right hand. You solemnly state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause now pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and hope you got Yes, I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. <coughs> please state and spell both your first and last name Samuel Hong. S A M U E L H O N G. All right, Kelsey. Thank you. What do you do for a living? Uh, I am a criminalist. And who are you employed by? I am employed by the City of Los Angeles and assigned to the Forensic Science Division of the Los Angeles Police Department. And how long have you been a criminalist? Uh, I have been a criminalist since 2011. Now, what is your background, training, and experience that qualifies you to be a criminalist? Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of Southern California. Um, in 2010, when I was hired as a laboratory technician to the Forensic Science Division, um, as a laboratory technician, it was when I learned to maintain chain of, chain of custody for evidence items, um, as well as learn how to operate in a crime laboratory. In 2011, I was promoted to criminalist and underwent a um, approximately year-long training in the screening of evidence items for biological materials for possible DNA testing. Um, in 2013, I underwent additional training, which was also approximately a year long at the LAPD DNA Academy, which was the internal training program for DNA analysts within the um, serology DNA unit. Um, in that training program, I tested hundreds of mock evidence samples, as well as read scientific articles, and um, performed and took um, practical as well as written examinations. Um, in addition to the training I had, um, I have performed as a trainer in the serology DNA unit, as well as um, performed validation studies for that unit. Have you ever testified before? Yes, I have. How many times? Um, I would put it at approximately 15 or more. Did you receive items booked under DR number 20060620 to perform testing on, in this case, around the time of May 12, 2020, to that of June 18, 2020? Uh, yes, I did. Now, were the items that you conducted analysis on the following items I'm going to name? A reference buccal sample from Gareth Purse House, a swab of a chain link fence, a swab of an unknown stain on the hallway floor, swab of a syringe, reference blood sample from Amy Harwick, a swab of left hand fingernails collected from Amy Harwick, swab of right hand fingernails collected from Amy Harwick, as well as hair like objects collected from swab of unknown stain on hallway floor. Is, are those the items you received for analysis during that time frame I just mentioned to you? Yes, they are. And what kind of testing was performed on these items? Um, it was STR DNA typing. And did you prepare a report that reflects your results in this, um, in this analysis? Yes, I did. It reflects all the standard procedures and protocols that you followed in conducting your testing? Yes. And this is a report that was prepared at or near the time of your analysis? Yes, that's correct. Now, were any of the items that I mentioned screened? Um, yes, they were. And what items that I just mentioned um, were screened? Um, so the, the item that actually underwent chemical screening tests was 
Um, item 34, which was the swab of the unknown stain from the floor. Um, that tested negative for both semen and blood and did not undergo any further analysis. It stopped at that point. And there's no other further analysis for any other sort of biological fluids that you conducted on that swab from the hallway floor? That's correct. Now, were there any DNA profiles obtained from evidence and reference samples in this case? Yes, there were. Now, in regards to the reference buccal sample from Gareth Pursehaus, there was already a DNA profile that was developed from that sample, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that was developed by another analysis? Yes. And there was also a reference blood sample from Amy Harwick. Uh, where there was already a DNA profile developed by another anal analyst, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So you didn't have to conduct any analysis on those two items, is that correct? That is correct. Now, how about the other item of, items of evidence I mentioned? Did you develop any DNA profiles from those remaining items? Um, so for item 30, which was the swallow of the chain link fence, um, that underwent two steps of the DNA process, and it was determined that there was insufficient DNA for further testing. So, what does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, insufficient DNA means that um, it had less than 35 total picograms of input DNA, which basically means that there's not enough DNA for us to get a good profile and do a comparison, and so um, we stopped samples at that point. Were you able to develop a DNA profile or obtain a DNA profile from the swab of the syringe? Um, also, no, that was also insufficient. And was that for the same reasons you just, just mentioned in regards to the chain link fence? Yes, that's correct. Was a DNA profile obtained from the <coughs> hair like objects collected from the swab and the unknown stain in the hallway? Actually, no, that was booked into evidence and never tested. Okay. Now, was there a analysis conducted of the swab of the left handed fingernail, of the left hand fingernails? collected from Amy Harwick? Yes. And were there any DNA profiles developed from the left-hand fingernails collected from Amy Harwick? Yes. And what were the results of that analysis? Um, the DNA profile was a mixture profile of two individuals, including one male. And did you take the DNA profiles you obtained from the swab of the left-hand fingernails and conduct a comparison? Yes, I did. And what did you conduct the t DNA profiles, those two that you developed, what did you compare them to? Um, I compared them to the reference samples from Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehaus. And what was your results of that analysis? Um, both Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehaus were included on the DNA mixture profile. And that is the left-handed fingernail? Yes, that's right. Now, did you perform a likelihood ratio or random match probability? Um, I calculated a likelihood ratio. Okay. And again, what is a likelihood ratio? Um, a likelihood ratio is a comparison of two probabilities that um, compares basically two different explanations for why we have a profile. Um, usually the first explanation would be um, what we call the prosecutor's hypothesis and it would include our person of interest and the the second proposition would be the defense hypothesis where we would say that it would, um, it's from an unknown individual, unrelated to the matter. And what was the likelihood ratio in this instance in regards to the left hand fingernails swab? Um, sure, so um, the likelihood ratio was at least, um, the, sorry, I should start over. The DNA profile was at least one septillion times more likely to occur if it originated from Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehaus than if it originated from Amy Harwick and an unknown individual. So that's a one with 24 zeros after it. Yes, that's right. Now, did you also conduct a DNA comparison, I'm sorry, did you develop a DNA profile from the right hand fingernail swab collected from Amy Harwick? Yes, I did. And were you able to obtain DNA profiles? Um, yes. And what were the DNA profiles, or what was the conclusion of your analysis? Um, also, both Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehaus were included in that DNA mixture profile. And, and that was based upon your comparison to the buccal sample from Gareth Pursehaus, as well as the blood sample from Amy Harwick, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And did you develop a likelihood ratio for the right-hand fingernail? Yes, I did. And what was that ratio? 
Um, that DNA profile was at least one quintillion times more likely to occur if it originated from Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehouse than if it originated from Amy Harwick and an unknown individual. What is one in quintillion? Um, that is a one with 18 zeros after it. And again, that is based on your hypothesis that it would be Amy Harwick, uh, the profiles of Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehouse present compared to that of Amy Harwick and an unknown person. Yes, that's correct. Now, did you also receive items that were booked under the same DR number we're referencing, but at this time from October 15, 2021 to December 2, 2021 for analysis? Yes. And were these evidence items the following? A swab of Purse House's left bicep, um, a swab of red stain from French doors in bedroom, a reference buccal sample from Gareth Pursehouse again, and a reference blood sample from Amy Harwick. Were those among the items that you received for analysis? Um, the first was, however, the I believe the red blood stain from the French doors as well as, as both of the references, those were previously typed, and so no further analysis was required in the laboratory um, for those items. So just to be clear, the swab of the red stain from the French doors in the bedroom had already been previously analyzed by another analyst. Yes, that's correct. The same for the buccal sample from Gareth Pursehouse. Yes. And the same from the blood sample from Amy Harwick. Yes. However, you did conduct an analysis of a swab from Pursehouse's left bicep, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now we'd already established our DNA profiles already obtained from that of the buccal sample from Gareth Pursehouse and the blood sample from Amy Harwick. Now there was a DNA profile that was developed previously from the French doors stain in the bedroom, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, in that profile that was developed, were you able to conduct a comparison as a result of those DNA profiles that had already been obtained? Yes. And what was the result of your analysis? Um, that profile matched the profile obtained from Amy Harwick. When you say that profile, you're talking about the profile from the swab of the red stain in the bedroom? Um, yes, that is correct. The French doors in the bedroom. Match that of the blood sample from Amy Harwick? Yes, that is correct. And was there a likelihood ratio conducted for that? Yes. And what was that? Um, the DNA profile was at least one septillion times more likely occur if it originated from Amy Harwick than if it originated from an unknown individual. And that's again one with 24 zeros. That is correct. Did you conduct um, an analysis of the swab of Pursehouse's left bicep? Um, yes, I did. And were you able to obtain a DNA profile from that analysis? Yes. And based upon your um, analysis, were you able to then conduct a comparison? Yes. And what were the results of your comparison? Um, that profile was a partial DNA profile that was consistent with the DNA profile obtained from Gareth Pursehouse. Was there any other contributors to that? No. <laughs> Thank you. Nothing further. Good morning. Good morning. So we have gone over it a little bit, but I want to talk about what a likelihood ratio is with regard to star mix. Sure. So when you say that there is a prosecution hypothesis and a defense hypothesis, those are just the terms that are generally applied, correct? That is correct, yes. So there's no discussion with the prosecution about their theory and the defense about their theory, and then those are the hypotheses put in? There is no discussion, correct. Okay. And when we are looking at a likelihood ratio, it's kind of a closed universe in the sense that the only things you're considering, the only outcomes, are whether a point of interest is included or whether it's an unknown person. Correct? In basic terms, yes, that is correct. So in this case, when you're looking at the mixtures, the only two things, or the only two hypotheses being considered is that it's Miss Harwick and Mr. Pursehouse, or Miss Harwick and an unknown person. Yes. And the likelihood ratio that's calculated by Starmix, that doesn't tell you that the source 
came from Ms. Harwick and Mr. Purse House, correct? Um, no, I, I don't know um, how a profile would get onto an item. Um, just that the profiles were um, the profile in question was consistent with the profiles obtained from those references. Yes, and that, that was a poorly phrased question on my part. We'll get to the actual manner of transfer. But the likelihood ratio, it tells you that between those two hypotheses, it's more likely that it was Ms. Harwick and Mr. Purse House. Yes. It does not definitively tell you that the sample, in fact, came from Ms. Harwick uh, and Mr. Purse House. A likelihood ratio doesn't tell you that. No, it does not. It just tells you that between those two hypotheses, that's what's more likely. Yes, that's correct. And you anticipated my next question. So getting to the manner of transfer. DNA analysis can't tell you how uh, specific DNA profiles were transferred onto an object, correct? No, they cannot. And in this case, you did analysis of DNA that was found on Ms. Harwick's nails, correct? Yes, I did, yes. And assuming that it was cumulative swabbing, so one swab done for all five fingers on one hand, you can't say how much DNA was present on any specific finger, correct? No, I cannot. And you can't say where on that finger the DNA was actually located? No, I cannot. With regard to the sample from Ms. Harwick's right hand, uh, there were two contributors, correct? Yes, that's correct. And the major contributor was found to be Ms. Harwick at 94%. Correct. And there was a total of 24.5 nanograms of total DNA. Um, may I refer to my notes for yes, that? Yes, would it refresh your recollection? Yes. With please. the court's permission? Yes. Yes, I would say that's actually a good approximation. Okay, and of that 24.5 roughly nanograms of total human DNA, about one nanogram was male DNA. Um, again, referring to my notes. About, yes. And is 24.5 nanograms considered a trace amount of DNA? No, that's actually quite a bit of DNA. Okay, and what about one nanogram? Um, one nanogram is the target input for an amplification, so um, one nanogram is actually not a bad amount of DNA also. And you're able to get a full profile from that, correct? Um, if it were an input of one nanogram of um, a single source sample, it, I would get a full profile. Okay, and so that's assuming it's a single source? That is assuming that, yes. Okay, and in this case, we are dealing with a mixed profile. Yes, that is correct. Okay, and do you recall in the electropharogram that was created at the loci for TPOX, there is one allele in Mr. Pursehouse's genetic profile that does not appear? Um, may I refer to my notes? Yes. Thank you. So just to be clear, your, um, your question was that Mr. Pursehouse had dropped out from that um, particular locus. So are you assuming that it's dropped out there? Um, I would have to actually refer to the reference again, Okay. if that's okay. Yeah. Your Honor, with yeah. the court's permission. Making it a little bit easier, I confirm I believe that there is a nine contained in Mr. Kershaw's reference sample that is not present at T-Pox in that sample. 
Okay, yes, that, that would be indicative of dropout. Okay, and assuming that you had a full profile from the amount of DNA that was present, um, so if you had a full profile and an allele that's present in an individual's genetic makeup is not present in a sample, that can lead to an exclusion, correct? To repeat that one more time, please? Yes, so assuming you have a sample that is a full sample, every allele has been accounted for, if you compare that to an individual and one of the alleles in their genetic profile is not contained in the sample you are comparing it to, that can lead to an exclusion, correct? Um, theoretically, it could. It could also be indicative of a null allele. Um, sometimes with STR typing, um, you will actually have, um, and it's actually specific to the technology you're using, um, you may see a null allele in one kit, but maybe not in another kit. Um, occasionally you do see this, so if, in the, in, in the example where if it was a full profile and I, I had only one mismatch, that would be very unlikely, and I would probably question it further before simply excluding that individual. Okay, and so in this sample also, I believe um, D22, there is um, also an allele in Mr. Pursehouse's profile that is not present in the sample that you compared it to, correct? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to refer to the reference no again. No problem, and specifically it would be allele 17 present in Mr. Pursehouse's profile that is not present in D22. Okay, yes, that would be indicative of dropout. Okay, and so for both of those, there is an allele present in Mr. Pursehouse's profile that is not reflected in the sample in question. Yes. So the actual DNA um, under Ms. Harwick's nails we're going to break at this point, okay? Oh. All right, ladies, so I'm just going to take a lunch break. Come back at 135. We have an issue that we have to discuss, all right? So 135, have a good Back on the record. Alternate number two, you're you're not here on the 22nd. Is that the day you leave? Yeah, I leave on the 24th. But, but you're second It is a <laughs> yes. Uh, so your last day with us is the 21st. Right. Okay. Do you need things to prep for your trip? Obviously. I'm pretty much ready. Okay. So you you don't mind staying with us for the no. additional two days? Okay. Well, thank you. So, are you sure, you, I, I asked you this, you sure you want to go to, everything's so old down there, and this is the house, you know, it's all dusty, and, okay, all right. Any event, we are prepared to go forward. Uh, I think they have a few more questions for this witness. You want to inquire, you may. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Tom, when you left off, we were talking about the DNA that was um, a couple of alleles in Mr. Pursehouse's profile that were not present in the sample. Yes. And you said that that is potentially because of dropout. Correct. Okay. And generally, dropout would occur because there was an issue with testing, uh, there was degradation, or the sample size, correct? Or, or the, uh, the quantity of the sample, yes. Okay. And so in this case, there was nothing that made you think there was any issues with the testing, no malfunction of the machine, correct? Correct. And there was nothing that indicated that there was significant degradation in the sample? Um, it's hard to tell with as, as low of a profile the minor contributor was, um, but um, it, it didn't look overly degraded at a glance. Okay, and so that would mean that it's the, the sample size or the quantity of DNA that likely led to the dropout? Yes, that is likely. Okay, and so getting back to the actual size of the sample here, um, the, the dropout is evident or correlates to the fact that this was a, a pretty small amount of DNA, correct? Yes, the minor contributor did not have a lot of DNA input into the amplification. 
And in this case, the minor contributor is Mr. Pursehouse. Um, yes. Um, with regard to that, that's the same for both samples, correct? The left hand and right hand. Yes, the proportions are slightly different, but um, the same as far as being consistent with Mr. Pursehouse's profile. Okay, and with both um, both swabs from the nails, there was no serology performed on either swab, correct? Um, that is correct. So there, there was no testing, or you can't say whether the DNA that was there came from saliva or skin or any other biological sample? Um, yes, so the screener in this case, who was criminal Segura, um, noted that those swabs had a grayish look to them and didn't know any sort of red or brown stains. And so um, further screening testing as far as testing for blood never occurred. And so I couldn't say what the source of that DNA is in any way. Okay, and the screening for blood never happened because there was nothing there that made the uh, criminalist think they needed to test for presumptive blood. That is correct. So just briefly, I have a couple more questions. I promise we're almost done. Um, with the star mix, going back to uh, the nails, the statistic attached to um, the, I believe it was the left hand, was one septillion times uh, more likely that it occurred from Mr. Pursehouse and Ms. Harwick as opposed to Ms. Harwick and an unknown individual. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. That likelihood ratio does not mean that it's one septillion times more likely that it's Mr. Pursehouse's DNA present, correct? Um, no, it does not. That would be a misstatement of the facts. And again, StarMix can't give you a match to anyone, correct? Um, no, StarMix could not, no. Okay, and that's not to say it's not reliable or not valid scientific analysis of DNA, but it does not produce a match. No, um, we, we do state match in our reports in some cases, but um, that's more of like a qualitative assessment that we do and not something that StarMix would do. Okay, I have just a moment. I have no further questions. All right, did right? <coughs> Yes, sir, just briefly. You were asked just now about star mix and whether it makes a determination as to a match. What does star max do in order for you to come to a conclusion when t conducting a comparison of DNA profiles? Um, so star mix uh, is a modeling program that we use and we can use it for deconvoluting complex mixtures and we can use it for calculating um, likelihood ratios which are statistics but um, as far as inclusions and exclusions, those, those are, um, while the statistics do, do support inclusions and exclusions, those are things that we like to um, determine before we even run the star mix if possible. And who makes those determinations? Um, the analyst does. And, for example, yourself? Yes. And you made that sort of analysis in regards to the evidence items that you analyze in this instance, is that correct? Um, I did. And based upon your conclusions, you're able to determine that there is a DNA profile matching the DNA profile belonging to that of Gareth Burshouse. Is that correct? Um, that, that he was included. Included. Yes. Now, you were asked several questions about dropout uh, by defense counsel. Were you surprised to find dropout when conducting your analysis of both the left and right hand swab of the fingernails? No, I was not. And why were you not surprised to find dropout? Um, sure, so in this case, the, the, both of the profiles from the fingernails had two contributors, and there was a major contributor and a minor contributor. Um, the minor contributor being the one consistent with Mr. Pursehouse. And when you see a large discrepancy in those mixture proportions, um, what ends up happening is you can only input so much DNA into your amplification and so the minor contributor doesn't end up getting um, amplified well at all. And that's just the nature of our technology and our instrumentation. And so because not too much of the minor contributor's DNA went into that um, amplification, and there are some actual factors in the amplification that would make that worse and exacerbated, 
um, it's not surprising to see drop out of a minor. Now, you were asked also about kind of the amount of DNA that you found in both the left and right hand fingernail swabs. On the right hand, you found male DNA that was um, compared to the DNA of Gareth Pursehouse as a match in the amount of one yeah, nanogram. Is that correct? Is it the state which you which you stated? Included, not match. Okay, so I'll change my. Very good. I'll rephrase, Your Honor. Yes. In regards to your testimony of the one nanogram of male DNA that included Gareth Pursehaus in regards to the right hand fingernail, there was one nanogram of DNA. Is that correct? Yes. So um, I should probably explain that a little further. There was one, approximately one nanogram of total male DNA present in that sample. But that sample was concentrated down to a volume of 25 microliters, and then an additional two microliters of that was used for the quantitation step, leaving 23 microliters total. And so when we do our amplification, we can only input one nanogram um, of DNA into our amplification. And so while there may have been one nanogram of total male DNA in that sample, um, after diluting and amplifying that sample, probably only about 40 picograms of male DNA um, went into that amplification reaction. Is that why you said on cross-examination that's actually quite a bit of DNA? Um, it is. In total, there was a lot of DNA. Um, unfortunately, not all of that one nanogram was able to go forward for the amplification reaction. Now, let's talk about the left uh, swab of the right, I'm sorry, the left swab of the fingernails from Amy Harwick. There, there was 0.252 nanograms of male DNA. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's also um, nanograms per microliter. Per microliter. And you said also in cross-examination that's quite a, a good amount of DNA. Why it, is that? Um, because if you have um, 0.252 nanograms per microliter and you have 23 microliters left after the quantitation step, you could do 0.252 times 23 and you would end up with roughly five nanograms in total. It, it's five times more DNA than you would need. Now we talked about Gareth Pursehaus being a minor contributor in regards to the left hand fingernail and, the, and Amy Harwick being a um, the larger contributor in that in that sample. I believe Amy Harwick is 86 uh, percent DNA contributor to that. Is that correct? Yes, for the left hand, yes. And Defendant purse house is 14%, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, despite him being a minor contributor versus a major contrib a contributor, there's still a likelihood ratio of 1 in 24 septillion in regards to the left-hand fingernail, is that correct? Yes, that was the likelihood ratio. Now, in regards to the right-hand fingernail, Gareth purse house is a 6% minor contributor, is that correct? Correct. And Amy purse house is a 94% contributor, is that right? That is right. Now, despite only being a 6% contributor to the swab of the right hand uh, fingernail belonging to Amy Harwick, the likelihood ratio there is still one in quintillion. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Any recross? Um, so, just to clarify, um, Amy Harwick is the reason that you're not surprised to find dropout is just because this is such a small amount of DNA that you're working with. Um, so in total, there was a pretty decent amount of DNA, like we talked about. Um, one nanogram would be the target for an amplification reaction in total. Unfortunately, when we were talking about one nanogram, we were talking about just the male DNA um, from that quantitation step. And actually, there's total DNA, which is you would have to take the genomic DNA that's in the left, the column to the left of that on the quantitation sheet. And that was actually much higher. And so. Um, we actually can't input all of the DNA that we have. We have to really maximize it at one nanogram. And so by diluting that out, we actually dilute out our, our male DNA as well. Okay. And so, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. So to go one step from that, by diluting out the male DNA when we input one nanogram into the amplification, um, there is a, actually just a very small amount of male DNA that actually gets amplified. Okay, and so the small amount of male DNA, that small amount is the portion that corresponds with Mr. Perthouse, correct? Presumptively, yes. 
Okay. And when you say that it's um, a good amount of DNA or a lot of DNA, that's in the context of DNA analysis, correct? Yes, our, specifically our DNA analysis, the STR kit that we use in the laboratory. And this is still an amount that's considered trace in the sense of you cannot see it with the naked eye. No, you could not. In fact, even large amounts of DNA you probably would not see. Okay. And whether or not an amount of DNA is good or a lot for testing does not correlate to whether or not it's relevant in a particular circumstance such as a criminal case, correct? Objection, improper opinion, speculation. Sustain. That last part that took issue with. Understood. Um, and so with both the left hand and right hand, you're saying that the, the small amount of um, male DNA is the reason that you were seeing that drop out. Yes. Okay. And in both of those samples, the small amount of male DNA is from the minor contributor who was Mr. Pursehouse. Yes. Okay. No further questions. Any redirect? No. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. I guess Dr. Luzzi is going to retake the stand. Is that correct? You're calling Dr. Luzzi, right? Uh, correct, Your Honor, but you're on cross examination. Right. Okay. Bob, well, that's right. Yeah. But he's taking the stand. Okay, we're ready for him. Oh, he did? All right. Well, so if he's not here tomorrow, we'll try for the 21st. Sure, we'll see. All right, uh, just a reminder, you're still under oath, doctor? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Ms. Bernstein Love, I believe you're inquiring. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Dr. Luzzi. Good afternoon. Dr. Luzzi, yesterday when you testified, you mentioned that you have looked at some x-rays from Cedar sinai is that correct? I did. I have to re amend that statement. Uh, as I, well, we were talking about CT scans. Uh, was, was, I was presented with some images that I thought were uh, taken before the body had arrived at the uh, medical examiner's office. I went back, after the uh, testimony, I went back to the office to, uh, okay, to let check. Me, let me stop you because I'm getting a little confused. So let me just ask a few questions and see if we can clear well, this up. Well, well, yeah, I think he was explaining, you didn't mean x rays, but CT scans? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, let him finish his answer. You went back to the office and what? And so the CT scans were actually obtained at the ME's, at the medical examiner's office. They were, in all likelihood, they were unavailable at the time I did my exam. So are you speculating when you say that? Objection, no. Can you finish his answer that he was... This is a narrative, Your Honor. Okay, well, first of all, uh, let's just cut to the chase here. You went back, the, the CT scans were produced by the coroner's office? These are likely to have been produced by the coroner's office. Okay. okay. Likely? Well, that, go ahead, inquire. So what does that mean, likely? So you're not sure where the source of these CT no, scans No, I, I am not sure, but likely these are the CTs obtained from the medical examiner's office. Um, are they marked in any way? These images are in sort of a PowerPoint uh, uh, demonstration, so I'm not sure exactly where they came from. Are they marked with um, the coroner's case number? Uh, may I look at them just to be, I have, I have a... Yeah, go ahead and look at them. Yes, may I approach? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> These are these are county these radiographs. These are X rays. Okay, for, for the, the record, um, Dr. Luzzi is looking at um, printout of papers that have images of various uh, 
scans on them and it's pointing to one that has actual marking uh, on the upper right corner. Uh, actually, that says LA County General Hospital, so that was actually, uh, must have been obtained from, from the hospital. Your Honor, may we approach? You didn't hear any of that, right? All right? There you go. Let's go. I didn't see any acknowledgement of that. But that's they just, they can't believe it. They're just staring at us. Um, All right, here we go. So, Dr. Luzzi, we had a sidebar conference discussing the uh, PowerPoint of CT scans. Is that correct? Yes. So, you don't know who prepared those that PowerPoint. Is that correct? No, I do not. And did you go through every image on that document to determine whether or not those images uh, came from the autopsy in this case? To determine whether they came from the uh, No, I didn't. I don't know where they're from. Okay. And who, who provided you with that, see, those, uh, that PowerPoint? The district attorney's office. Okay. And who from the district attorney's office was it? Ms. Mariano. All right. And uh, did she discuss those images with you at a meeting that you had with the deputy district attorney prior to your testimony today? I believe we dis discussed it over the telephone uh, uh, prior to the, today, yes. And each of the images has uh, arrows pointing to something specific, is that right? Yes. Let's be clear that the, the particular images that we're speaking of have to do with two areas of the uh, deceased, is that correct, on the body? Yes. Uh, yes. And, and for the, the record, can you state what they are? Yes, the pelvis. Okay. And the, um, excuse me. There are images of the pelvis. There are images of the shoulder girdle, so the scat, the shoulder blade, and there are images of the face. Uh, is there anything other than those three areas? I believe may, there were more. May, uh, so, as far as CT scans, and we have uh, the cervical spine. Yes. All right. So those are the four areas. Four areas. Yes. Now you prepared a uh, autopsy report. Is that correct? Yes. And at the time you prepared your autopsy report, you made no mention of nasal nasal fractures in your report. Is that correct? Correct. I'd like to show you what has previously been marked as. Peoples 113, this is uh, the report number 20, which is an overview of marks you found on the <coughs> decedent's body, is that correct? And this is the clean diagram of the external examination, so it's marking the therapy, uh, their general characteristics, it's not marking the wounds. All right. So let's let's go over what what is here. Um, let's start down here on the bottom right with TX. What is that? Treatment therapy. Okay. And what do you what could you explain which each of these? Let's start with oral ET. So oral endotracheal tube. She was intubated. And the next one. OGT oral gastric tube. So she had a tube entering into her stomach to relieve pressure in her stomach. And that tube would go down through her throat. Yes, from the mouth to the to the stomach. 
And is that why you had indicated some of the um, hemorrhaging that you noticed during the uh, dissection of the strap muscles could have been due to medical intervention? Not in those areas. No. Not in the areas that I described injury. Okay. Not in the area you described injury, but in the other areas. I don't describe said. hemorrhage in the areas where those pass through. Okay. And what was the next thing? CT. So she had a right-sided chest tube. And then midline lap? Well, you skipped over TC, oh, so she okay. had a, a left side thoracotomy, so they opened her chest to do uh, basically cardiac massage. Okay. And then midline lap? Laparotomy, so they opened up her abdomen to look at the injuries in her abdomen. And the next? Large bore intravascular uh, catheter, right groin. And the next? A Foley, a bladder catheter. And then these uh, notations at the bottom. So those are all needle punctures. They, um, I, I put them down there because sometimes uh, we don't know if the needle punctures are self-inflicted or if they're therapeutic. And how many needle punctures did you know? Well, you can count them right there. I'm not sure if we're getting a full picture of it. One, two. It has Looks that. like eight, eight needle punctures. And, and this down at the bottom? CPR, so there is evidence of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And when you say evidence of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, would you uh, indicate that that was due to finding some rib fractures? The rib fractures, yes. And then here in the middle column? So these are her general characteristics. Okay, uh, we, I think you went over those. And then um, going to the diagram of the body, could you start here? So everything that we just discussed on that left, or excuse me, right hand column is marked on there. I just put it in that column so it's easier for me to remember when I'm writing re my report. Okay, thank you. <coughs> now you were aware at the time that uh, you did the autopsy in this case that the decedent had been treated at, in a hospital prior to her arrival. Yes. And that she died in a hospital. Yes. Um, is the Department of Medical Examiner's protocol to uh, request admitting hospital blood so that it is, because it is preferred, is it a preferred toxicology specimen? If it's available, we try to get it. It's not always uh, available and, and sometimes it's not always received. Did you make such a request in this case? I did not make a request. Um, and is that particularly important if an individual has received blood transfusions? Yes, it would be helpful if, if, if the decedent received drug blood transfusions, yes. And you reviewed the medical records in this case, is that correct? I reviewed what was available to me from the investigator. I don't know if I had the entire medical record at the time I started the autopsy. How about before your testimony? Have you reviewed the Cedar sinai medical records prior to your testimony today? I've, I've skimmed through them, but I, don't, I, don't, cannot, I cannot legitimately dis, uh, dis, discuss them in detail. Okay, but do you recall that this patient received blood transfusions? I would not be, no, I don't recall that, but I would not be surprised. So you would expect somebody who received the treatment that this person received to have received blood transfusions? Yes, may I check a note one? Yes. So I don't have anything additional to add. That, that I thought maybe they had mentioned blood transfusions in, in, in the investigator's report, but I don't see that. So your answer stands that you would expect a blood transfusion would have uh, occurred? Yes. Okay. Would it refresh your recollection to look at the Cedar sinai medical records? Yes. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, today I should mention, I, I've uh, advised jurors before in other cases that I've had. Um, uh, sometimes uh, if we're at sidebar or what have you, and it may seem the attorneys are angry or the judge is angry, it's an adversarial process and people get passionate and so forth. We're all professionals here. We've been, do I've been doing this for years. I'm very experienced attorneys. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. So don't feel uncomfortable. It's just part of the process. We all get along well. We still like each other. Yeah. Well, some less than others, but most of us. No, we like each other. All right. <clears throat>
do you feel comfortable just flipping through, or do you want me to try to point something out? So massive, I see massive transfusion protocol here. So, in this is uh, looks like the operative report. Uh, so I'm assuming I have to assume, without entirely reading, taking the time to read it, that that uh, that she received tra trans uh, uh, transfusions. Yes, with the massive transfusion protocol. So, so you're. You do believe she received massive yes. transfusions? Yes. Uh, that she received blood transfusions. Okay. How many? I don't know. Okay. So she did receive a transfusion? Yes, sir. Right. Now, you had said on direct examination that you had ordered an H screen. Yes. Now, you're not limited only to an H screen for toxicology examination are you that's well I'm not limited I'm not sure why what you're asking well let's say you had suspected uh, uh, poisoning in this case Especially would you be able to uh, order different types of toxicology testing different than the H screen objection of suspects on that well I think she's just trying to make a point if he has the authority to do to order certain things so I'll, I'll lock that if it was brought to my attention that there was a concern for poisoning I would see what we could do to do specific testing And doesn't the uh, Department of Medical Examiner Coroner uh, Forensic Science Manual indicate that unless a decedent has been hospitalized over 24 hours, suspected homicidal poisonings should have at least a C screen? That may be the case. I, I'm, I'm not aware of that. If you suspected poisoning, you wouldn't just throw up your hands and say, well, undetermined. You would still try to determine the cause of death, correct? Yes. But in this case, you did not suspect poisoning. Is that correct? At the time, I didn't have a reason to suspect it. And you made a determination as to cause of death? Yes. And that cause of death was blunt force injury. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any of uh, redirect? Yes, sir. Dr. Luzzi, yesterday you were asked about different injuries to the decedent's body and what the basis of your conclusions in regards to her injuries were. You recall that? Yes. I'm sorry, the base of your conclusions and? of her injuries. I Thank you. Um, yesterday you referred to some x-rays that you reviewed prior to your testimony. Is that correct? Yes. You Yesterday you had reference that they were x-rays from Cedar sinai At the time I did. I, I believed that at the time they were from there. You were interrupted on cross-examination, but did you have an opportunity to access um, the general system to the coroner's office after your testimony yesterday? I did. And were you able to confirm that there were, in fact, x-rays and CT scans conducted by the medical, examiner's, the medical examiner's office? Yes, to clarify, I did see the x-rays prior to doing the autopsy as per the usual protocol at the office. The CT scans, I was unaware of that they were there. Um, and likelihood, the system that, that brings up those images on our computer was down. That happens with some frequency at the coroner's office. Well, does it? I, I, are you speculating? To a certain extent, I, I, this is past, it, it's consistent with past uh, events, Your Honor. Okay. Oh. But you were able to confirm yesterday after your testimony that there were, in fact, CT scans conducted by the coroner's office. Sorry. Yes. Now, you were asked on cross examination about blood transfusions. Uh, for the victim. You were unable to determine how many blood transfusions took place. Is that correct? Correct. Now, let's say one blood, tra blood transfusion, um, at least one blood transfusion took place in regards to the decedent. Would it cause the injuries that you documented in People's 113, I'm sorry, 114, 
Um, would it be responsible for those injuries to the decedent's extremities? I've got an objection, Your Honor. This is beyond the scope of cross, and it's a question that <coughs> is calling, you know, it's, it's phrased in a way that exceeds the scope. I, I don't want to make a speaking objection, but the question was about collecting blood not about the nature of injuries. Well, I, again, uh, the, the topic and the issue of blood transfusion uh, was broached uh, on, uh, on cross. I think uh, counsel is allowed to uh, question, to some extent, um, what impact, if any, that would have. And that's, so. that's my only question. Okay, and that's your only question? Uh, why don't you repeat it for the doctor? Sure. You were asked about blood transfusions on cross-examination. Would the decedent receiving a blood transfusion be consistent with the injuries to the decedent's extremities as documented by you in People's 114? There would be no relationship of a blood transfusion to these injuries on that diagram. Thank you. Now, yesterday, um, and on cross-examination, you testified about the cause of death being blunt force injuries. Yes. Now, we spent an awful lot of time yesterday talking about strangulation. Now, would you say that strangulation was a contributing factor to the decedent's cause of death? Yes, that's how I listed as a, exactly as you stated, contributing factor, evidence of manual strangulation. And why is that a contributing factor to her cause of death? If, if you remember, we were talking about the injuries of her neck, and she had, first off, she had the petechia on her face. She had abrasions and contusions on her neck, but most significantly, she had those hemorrhages and those muscles on her neck. And those are consistent with manual strangulation. And I know that you came to that conclusion based on your post-mortem examination as you testified yesterday, as well as an examination of the x-rays and CT scans that uh, were available to you. Now, when you... Go ahead. Oh, I'm saying that the CT scan x-rays wouldn't really contribute anything to the manual strangulation diagnosis. Okay. So just to be clear, your um, contributing factor conclusion in regards to strangulation is independent from any sort of uh, analysis in regards to x-rays or CT scans. Yes. Now just to refer back to those x-rays or CT scans, when you made any conclusions during your testimony, either on direct or on cross, did you base that on your study of the images themselves? Any of the diagnoses of injuries? Correct. Uh, all these injuries uh, were uh, observed at the autopsy. The ones that I saw are listed in here in autopsy. I may have seen the pelvic fractures on, on the x-rays. And again, I want to clarify x-rays, not CT scans. Um, but my radiology skills are not, I'm not confident in them enough to base it on x-ray alone. So I like to palpate, look, uh, feeling, look, and, and, and kind of make, see it for myself with my own eyes, these injuries. And this refers to not just the pelvic fractures, but also the scapula fracture that you observed? I did not see the scapula fracture uh, at the autopsy. We don't, we don't reflect the skin around the scapula, and this is, so I did not see that. But so so those, that is based on the images that were provided to me. And based on those images that you provided to me, it's the images themselves in which you were able to make that determination? Yes. And does that also go with the fractures to the, basal fractures to the face? I know you observed that in your autopsy as well, but did you also rely on the CT or x-rays in front of you? I didn't see facial fractures on x-ray. The type of x-ray we take of the head doesn't really lend to identifying facial fractures, at least for somebody of my basic radiology skills. So I didn't, and I did not feel facial fractures. I will press on the face to see if there's any crepitance or crunchiness of the face, and I did not feel that. So that, the only, those facial fractures are just see from this image. And that's from the image itself? Yes. Thank you, nothing further. Um, Ms. Bernstein, do you have any? Yes. your finding for the cause of death. Yes. Uh, that was redirect. A redirect, I'm sorry. Yeah. And when you determine the cause of death, 
was um, blunt force trauma. You made a separate finding uh, that this was a homicide because of the manual strangulation. Isn't that correct? Manual strangulation, the, uh, the, I, the evidence that she was in some kind of, uh, of a fight. Uh, she has the injuries of her hands. Uh, defensive and offensive or assaultive type of injuries. So you take the whole spectrum of, of injuries that we're seeing. And yes, this comes to, this is, I concluded this was a homicide. All right. So, so when you say the strangulation contributed, it contributed to your finding it was a homicide, correct? It's a contributing factor to her death. It's, do you recall meeting with me uh, prior to your testimony today? I, rem I remember I met with... And do you recall? I remember that was two, three, two, three years ago. Uh, so I don't recall what we discussed. I remember meeting. And do you recall stating at that time that you probably would have found this to be an undetermined death but for the strangulation? No. You don't recall saying that? No. For the strangulation, we have evidence that she's in a scuffle. She has, she, she's okay. in a in a fight. Let uh, me I ask if, let me rephrase it. Do you recall my telling, I, I was with an, another individual, Aaron Morris, do you recall? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask for dis judge of discovery. Well, this is, she said prior to testimony, it isn't prior that it occurred today. She met with this individual in some fashion or other. So I, I don't know about discovery or whether you received it or not. But no, that's what I'm asking. All right, I'm going to allow it. Go ahead. Thank you. And when we met, do you recall stating that you had made a determination that the cause of death was blunt force trauma. And if strangulation had not been present, you may have found the cause of death un undetermined. Objection asked and answered, he already answered. Well, I, I would, this is a little different. She said undetermined. She's added that. So can you answer that while you're able to? I don't recall saying that. I'm going to ask. All right, thank you. I have no objection. to discovery of that report. All right, your objection is noted for the record. All right. Amy? Is a contributing factor to the decedent's cause of death manual strangulation? Yes. And is your determination that the manner of death is homicide based on the entirety of your post-mortem examination? Yes. Does that include the injuries, uh, lethal injuries to her torso and head? Yes. Does that include the manual strangulation? Yes. Does that also include both the assaultive and defensive wounds to her extremities? Yes. Thank you, nothing further. Okay. No. All right, you may step down, Thank you. Uh, you may call your next witness. You can call the Dr. Ferraz to the same. All right, sir. It's working. No. Uh, Detective, you can raise your right hand, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause of not taking before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. Is that a seat? This water bottle. Please state and stop with your first and last name. Yes, uh, Luis Carranza, L U I S C A R R A N Z A. All right, counsel. Luis Carranza. Uh, Detective Carranza, can you please tell the jury what is your occupation and your current assignment? I'm a homicide investigator with the Los Angeles Police Department uh, assigned to West Bureau Homicide. And how many years have you been a police officer? January will be 27 years. Uh, excuse me. January will be 28 years, sorry. And how many years have you been a homicide detective? Uh, I've been a homicide detective for over 16 years. And were you assigned as one of the investigating officers in the death of Amy Harwick? Yes, I was. Okay. And did you go to the crime scene, uh, 2086 Mound Street, back on February 15, 2020? Yes. Okay. And did you uh, obtain ring videos from the neighbor's house, 2080 uh, Mound Street? Yes. And in reviewing those videos, did you review a video that was at about time uh, <coughs> 1, 11 in the morning? Yes. And is this a video of an individual uh, landing on his knees uh, on 20, at the location of 2080 Mount Street? Yes, that's correct. And uh, did you notice whether that individual was wearing gloves at the time at 1.11 in the morning? Yes. And what was your 
What did you notice? I noticed that the individual was wearing gloves on both hands. Looking at people's exhibit number eight, video labeled with the time of 11 Just gonna just pause it there. And it's paused at, uh, this is at the beginning of the video. Okay, and I paused it at the very beginning of the video. And what, can you tell us what, 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 how did this assist you in your investigation regarding what this individual is wearing on his hands? Well, the video shows the individual landing at, in Mr. Uh, Montano's residence and captured by the ring cameras that Ms. Uh, Kindbach installed at her end of the property, showing the individual landing on the ground, getting up and running uh, towards the rear of Mr. Montano's residence, which led down to that empty lot full of grass. Okay, and what's he wearing on his hands at this point in the video? Judge, you call for speculation. Well, can you, can you tell? Yes, Your Honor. Have you viewed this video hundreds of times in slow motion and fast? He's wearing uh, gloves. Same objection, Your Honor. Your objection is not overruled. And let me, let me play it just slowly. All right. Uh, do you also see an individual carrying something? Yes, he's carrying uh, something in his right, up to his left arm. Do you know what? Can you tell what that is from just looking at it? I, I can't. <clears throat> on February 15, 2020, later that day, uh, defendant Gareth Persas was arrested, correct? Yes. And did you uh, meet with them on that day, later that day? Yes. And did you obtain a buccal swab from his inner cheek? Yes. And did you, uh, why did you do that? Uh, I got a buccal swab of saliva for uh, for DNA purposes. Were well, you going to request for a, a, a DNA profile to be uh, for that swab to be analyzed and for you to obtain a, a DNA profile for Mr. Persehouse? Yes. And did you book that swab as item number one for this particular case? Yes, I did. You have just one moment, Your Honor. Yes. Yeah. That was booked for case number 20060620. That's correct. That's your case number in this case. Yes. Uh, the voicemail message from Michael Herman, where he tells you that he's. Uh, he was thinking about the doors and some other stuff, and then he remembers that he heard a glass dropping earlier in the evening. Do you know what date he actually left that voicemail message? I don't know the date, but I know the date that I recorded that from Detective Masterson's cell phone. Okay. What date was that? Uh, February 17, 2020. So, so it was not February, it was not February 20, 2020. That's correct. It wasn't February 20, 2020. That's when we called him to talk about that voicemail that he left. And how do you know that it was uh, at least prior to February 7th, either on February 17th or prior to February 17th when he left that voicemail message? How do you know that? I researched the, uh, the call, I'm sorry, I researched the file and I saw that I recorded it on the 17th. That's the date that the file was created on my digital recording device and I downloaded it to my uh, computer, which I then turned over to your office in the process of disco dis discovery. And now, have you, did you request to monitor the defendant's uh, jail visitations? Yes, I did. And previously we marked people's exhibit number 127, looking at page, bless you, looking at page C, the very top, you see this visitation, I'll zoom in on it. March 3rd, 2020, around 2.30 p.m.? Yes. And this would be for uh, Gareth Pursehouse? That's correct. And the visitor name is Sori, Cor uh, Cory Soria and Alan Eigen, friends. Yes. So you said you, you marked that? Yes, this is People's Exhibit Number 127. Thank you. And looking at 
page C. Uh, in regards to that particular visitation on that day, did you obtain, did they provide you uh, with a video recorded uh, visitation? Yes, they did. And have you reviewed that? Yes. Right. Your Honor, at this time, and this is about, so this is March 3rd. Is this about 16 days after the death of Amy Harwood? What did you say? Is it about 16 days after the death of Amy Harwood? Uh, what's it, March? What, what today? March? March 3rd. And February? Yeah, February 15th. 15, 16, 16, 18 days or so, something like that. February has 28 days. Yeah, February has 28 days, so. Well, approximately. Remember, well, it could be 29 odd years, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't remember if there was not year. Approximation. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. right. that's, why, that's why I said approximation. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a CD, Your Honor, labeled March 3rd, 2020. May this be marked people's next in order? Yeah, 128. And is the transcript another exhibit? Or it, is it it'll, be, it'll be A. Okay. It's a 27 page transcript. It'll be 28A. And permission to publish the transcript? Yes. And this is about a 30 minute of jail visit recording. All right. And what notes? Yes. Tomorrow you're going to come in at 11 o'clock just to give us, we're going to meet early so we can discuss uh, some housekeeping matters. Um, and so, but this, this case um, it, it is winding down, I can guarantee you that. So, but we need some time. And then additionally, we have instructions, jury instructions to uh, discuss uh, counsel and, and the court. And the court has to read these to you. I mean, what I've been doing lately is recording them and then play the recording. You'll have these in the back to guide you in your deliberations and will describe the, your duties and then also the, the law that applies in this case, all right? So 11 o'clock tomorrow, just make a note of that, all right? So uh, yes. before I play the recording, um, on this date of March 3rd, 2020, at about prior to this date, had there been some media attention related to the death of, his, uh, of Dr. Amy Harwood? Yes. And have you reviewed this particular visitation video we're about to show to the jury? Yes, I have. And in the video, are you able to see the individuals the, the, who are indicated in the, in the visitation log as friends? Are you able to see them on the video? Yes. How about uh, Mr. Gareth Pursehouse? No. Can you hear him? Yes. Can you, is part of it, the top of his head showing? Yes, I believe so. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask to play the recording in. This is about a half hour long. Are you guys okay a, a half hour before the break? Yeah. Yes? Okay. All right, very good. <coughs> Hey guys. Hey. 
X, oh shit, oh, so I, I hit up an X to grab him. So I hit up an X, or I, I, I had my lawyer uh, write down the message for an X to go to my house and pick up all of our old sex toys. So <laughs> if you go there before, just grab everything for <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so, because I didn't want my brother to be doing all that. <laughs> you know, it's a little odd. Uh, maybe you could hit her up. Her name is Angela Calderon. Angela Calderon. Yeah, my brother will have her info, and Facebook will be able to find you. Can find her on Facebook too. Uh, I deleted all my accounts. Yeah, so. yeah, I know some when you got out because we were using that against you and everything. Yeah, uh, well, and also people were posting like crazy hate. And, uh, there's like, fuck it, why, why bother? And and uh, uh, what else? to this recording did you also take that into consideration for your investigation yes and so at this point he's being asked uh, are you ever getting out and is Mr. Purcell's statement correct and Corey sorry says ever is that what you're trying to say and he says yes that's correct I'm going to continue playing the recording I've, I've seen what's coming at me and it's not good I'm not getting out super fun Defenders are really good, but it doesn't matter. And did they get you on video? <laughs> no, there's no, there's nothing. Up. It's, it, I don't want to. I can't talk about okay. it. Okay, okay. No, no worries, no worries, no worries. Uh, pause it there. So I'm pausing at seven minutes and thirty-one seconds. So it appears that uh, Corey Soria is asking whether they got you on video. That's correct. correct. And then there's a response. Yes. Now, on line 18 of page 8, 
Uh, Corey says, then you don't smoke, which is good. And Mr. Fursow says, yeah, correct? That's correct. He acknowledges that he doesn't smoke. Yes. Yes, that's correct. And I saw Rudy was talking shit about me in the in the news. Remember Rudy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was for sure. Okay, so you got out and you were able to to, to do a little research on him. Yeah, just for a minute, and then you know, back here. Trying to, yeah, now I just need to get the money uh, back, and that's really my main concern: money, money, and helping my brother, because uh, my place has a lot of shit to move, and. Uh, and I, I know, and hopefully, hopefully, it's 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 a lot of work to move my stuff. So if he gets the money back, he could hire helpers, you know. But either way, he's still gonna need help, no matter what. Um, all the sex. Thank you, thank you. Is he? Uh, uh, are you trying to sell your shit? What are you trying to do? Move it down there? Get a U-Haul down there? With with? Well, yeah, a combo. So uh, one thing is, obviously, my name is a big thing right now. So if you could sell stuff as mine to like weird collectors, you should be able to get more money for it. You know that's a real thing. You know that's a real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, same thing with my car. My car uh, isn't paid off, so hopefully it can sell that for more than it's worth. Uh, they're the, sa the same thing. And uh, yeah, so whatever my brother wants to have, he can have. And whatever he doesn't want, it needs to get sold. So he, so he doesn't have to move it, if possible. And uh, yeah, hopefully try to try to do that. Uh, I also told, he probably won't do it, I told him to uh, get all, all the 6,000 jokes I've written from my, my Google Docs, I told him to get them and then turn them into a book and sell it online as, as my book jokes, because I don't make money. There you go. Um, so if you could maybe help him with that too or something like that. And, uh, uh, I mean, I sent you, I guess that's, that's, yeah, I don't know. What do you, what's, what's, uh, what's some news for me that you guys maybe have? I don't know. Anything? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, we, we, we've, uh, me and friends with you, we kind of kept quiet. We didn't know anything about anything. I mean, we, we only know what we see on the news, but clearly everything, you know. He hunted her down at X Bays, and they, well, no, he's paid the shit to fuck. So you know what I'm saying? Everything's kind of a yeah. Uh, two, two, two people here, uh, you know, cues and stuff. So we just kind of wanted to be like, you know, until we hear from you or or, or uh, you know, find out later, we're not gonna jump on that fucking. Um, yeah, just stay uh, out of the media completely. It's not. There's no benefit. No, no. Yeah, I was I was uh, hit up a bunch of times. Already, trying people were trying to and sell uh, pictures and yeah, Daily Mail, whatever it was like. Responding at 13 minutes and 47 seconds. Uh, on line two to three, Corey Soria says, uh, uh, two people are here have been, you know, accused of stuff. So we just kind of want it to be like, you know, until we hear it from you. Do you remember him saying that? Yes. Okay. The restraining order just ended fucking two days ago, and they're like, you could, "No, that's a lie. It ended like <laughs> fifteen six <laughs> years ago." <laughs> no, we, we like, know that they, the truth came uh, out. I mean, uh, oh, okay, they, had, they put Amy on a, a forty-eight hour CBS. You know that forty-eight hours? Oh yeah, they called my brother. 
they wanted me to be on it when I was out. They called us when we were out. Um, yeah, uh, anything, anything like, yeah, so like you said, they're trying to sell, buy things, whatever. If there's something like big ticket money wise comes in, then fucking sell it. Just give the money to my brother. Cause he's going to be, he's dealing with so much. Like, I don't care. There's no, there's no, it doesn't matter. You know? Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, just, yeah, that, I mean, that's essentially it. Help, help, please help my brother. And, uh, how's, hopefully how's your sister doing? I, I remember I met your sister with you like 15 years oh, ago. Yeah. She's also not great. And she's oh, dealing with, I mean, I'm shitty, but there's, there's literally nothing I can do about anything. So it doesn't really make, make a difference how I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm stuck where I am. Nothing can change it. And, uh, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah, help, yeah, help my, my brother try to sell my stuff for more profit to weirdos. Uh, he think he, my brother thinks my car is only worth like blue book sale, blue book price, but obviously it's not worth that. It's worth way more. Lexuses don't really go down in price. So don't let him like lose money on the, what kind of car was it? It's an IS. Alexis, is it the yellow one? No, it's a, red, it's a new red one. I had to go to 2017 when I got hit. Ah, I gotcha. Okay, yeah, so it's a it's an IS 250T. So it's you know a new car worth money, whatever. So sell that for the my brother said it owed 30 on it. So make sure he sells it for way more than that because there's no way where it's not worth more than 30. Uh, it's only got like 10,000 miles on it. Oh wow! Yeah, and. and uh, and a little leather hole, it's got a hole in it that's leather, but that's pretty easy to fix. It's like, I already have the kit for it to fix. I just never did it. Damn it, I actually did it now. Um, the garage, at my house, the garage is full. Every tool in the garage is mine. Like, every, like almost everything in the garage is mine at my house. So just keep that in mind when you're getting stuff out there. Only some stuff is my landlord's. And nothing in the shed is mine. Everything is the Everything in the shed is someone else's. Um, and, uh... Uh, what else? Yeah, there's, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, everything, uh, yeah, everything comes down to just helping, helping my brother pack up my, my world and, and, um, get it to his place. Yeah, go to San Diego and hopefully, and he's trying to buy a house right now, so I hope he can get that money back and he can use that to buy a house. And then if I get out, I can have a roof. <laughs> it'll become a bigger house. Um, my lawyer's supposed to, I'm kind of court tomorrow. If you guys want to come to court tomorrow and see me from a distance, you know, you can. Today, yeah, we thought we, I, I, I didn't even know there was, well, it's not even half a video, I just see the top of your hair. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's two seats, I sat at the wrong one, so I'm like leaning over. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah, uh, because <laughs> the screen was off on this one, it was on on the other one, so it was like, oh, okay, so uh, the on one, right? Nope. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I have court tomorrow. Last time uh, I was in court, Amy, some of Amy's friends were there eyeballing me. If you guys want to come, you can, but the, the media will be there, so you don't have to. It doesn't it doesn't help me if you're there or anything. Do you know what time? I'm I have to shoot I, tomorrow. I have no Do way you? of knowing. It, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Then. I don't think it matters. It does, yeah, it doesn't. Like all, all yeah, I'm not really doing anything tomorrow, so don't you know you don't have to come if you don't want to, or if you have to say whatever. This is when you plead, right? No, not no, not tomorrow, because we still haven't we still have got all the evidence. From from the thing, so I'm doing plea like another time. We're delaying it again. Oh, okay. Because they're getting they're too slow in giving me the evidence. Um, and uh, or at least all the evidence. And uh, what else? Should I yell? Should I yell louder? Is it better if I talk louder or something like that? Oh, okay, okay. And um, yeah. So tomorrow will be I mean nothing. But last time the media was there and they're trying to film me and then the but they didn't let them. So hopefully they won't let him film me again tomorrow. And I, I, 
did read something online, uh, I think from one of Amy's friends, it was somewhere on, that someone kept posting that, uh, that uh, I guess your attorney pointed to a girl and she's like, I was mortified and I went down to see him. And, you know, one of Amy's friends had gone there and posted about it and I guess uh, your attorney had pointed her out to you. Oh yeah, they thought they were my family because he didn't know who they were. And he's like, who are those people? And I was like, they're clearly not people I know. They're probably her friends. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> they just, they look like that type of people. So that's what they were. Um, and they were just staring me down, <laughs> which is fun, not fun. Um, what else? But yeah, I mean, yeah, it doesn't, tomorrow is nothing, so it doesn't really matter if you come, really. It, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. My lawyer has your names. She, she was going to call you if, like, something actually matters, but uh, that fix it. nothing, like, actually matters yet. Okay, and, cool. Um, that way I can take, you know, what days to take off or whatnot, you know? Yeah, yeah. If, if they even matter. Um, I mean, yeah, so it's a trial. Yeah, that's in a year. That's what? That's, a, that's in a year. The actual trial's in like a year. So I'll be here for a while. It's going to be fun. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I broke broken record, but yeah, the main thing is help my brother with the, that shit. And um, uh, I need to get a pencil. I, it sucks. I keep thinking of all my all jokes as, as usual. There's nothing to write them down, down with, so they're missing. <laughs> what do you? What, I can see you. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, okay, what's uh? Wait, lean back. Lean back. I can see you better if you like. Uh, there we go. Now I can see your face. Oh, okay. What is the? You can see us. Yeah, that's that's where I can see you. So what's oh, the? Okay. What's okay? So we need what's, six this, jokes from your brother. Okay. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Turn those into a book. Try to find. Try right now. Actually, try to find a uh, publisher that'll give you money ahead of time for for that. Like right now, you know what I mean just based on my name because of the media like that could be a million bucks I don't know I don't know how that shit works um uh, but that would be good for my brother uh but I, I do have a joke for you uh what's what's the most feminine candy bar huh her she's <laughs> well, we you um, yeah you got your sense of humor you're making the best of it now. hey did yeah. you get to give you a pen and paper to actually like write stuff no, on there inside? not yet I'm trying to get a pencil I have a piece of paper but I haven't got a pencil yet uh, what is it what is it called if you, if, uh, if someone likes to have like a girl to pee on them <laughs> if, what's it called if a girl like if someone likes a girl to urinate on them her pees <laughs> At this point of the conversation, does he ever mention that anything that happened with Amy was an accident? No. Does he ever mention wanting to commit suicide? No. <laughs> I hope they put you. At, I hope they put you in Gen Pop so you can uh, try your jokes out. Try my jokes. I, I already did when I was in another one where I got to try my jokes out. Uh, um, but uh, but yeah, if you can turn if if, if you can tr start contacting publishers seriously, like uh, like any anyone that like that can do that 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 feel like that's a thing, but it won't last. Yeah, yeah, no, you know. Sure. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so I, I I assume my brother will probably try to move on the weekend. I don't know what you guys are like on the weekends, um, or. Or yeah, or and I mean, or if you could, um, you could you could maybe coordinate with my landlords and go there uh, on your own if you have time beforehand or something like that. And my brother knows how to get a hold of them. My brother does how. He has their numbers. Okay, so that's the only name with number that we need because we don't have anything to write. So yeah, your brother yeah, you just is going to help. Oh, that's my part. What you no, my. Oh, what's my part? Who's the first? That's <laughs> in San Francisco, and then in Trump yeah, drives. Yours, huh? Kale Kale got it. Yeah. He, he has 
he has a way to get a hold of everybody. Beautiful. And, uh, and um, I think, oh, and find out, uh, he might have got my car out of, uh, uh, he might have picked up my car already, I'm not sure. So if he, he might need help picking up my car, like to get up here, with, and hit a court, but I'm not sure, because it costs money every day that it's in, it's in uh, deep, you know, it's towed or whatever. So he might need help. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he might, he might have already got it, but I'm not sure. So he might, it might be, yeah, it yeah, might be helpful if you guys could just go get it. Yeah, so he, I know he, I know he got them to like let it out to not me, but I don't know if he actually physically got it already or not. So that might be helpful if you do that, timing wise. And then you could just put it in my garage at home, and then the clicker is part of the rear view mirror. Have I, have you talked to your roommate or anything? Or not your roommate, but your landlord? Yeah, my brother did. I can't talk. I, yeah, I've only talked to my brother. That's the only person I've talked to. Glad you guys are here. Gotcha. Uh, I was beginning to wonder if like, no one fucking likes me. No, no one's gonna come. No one else is probably gonna come. I think you're it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. No, we uh, hey, Shane, Dave, Dave, and Shameless. We tried to all come, but they only let one at a time. Two. Oh. Two. I mean, two. one plus uh, one. So two at a time. Are they here right now, or they're coming another time? No, no, no. They have to do it. Um, uh, we try to get it. Uh, on Saturday, but Dave had ended up having to work, and there was a okay. girl that they waited like a year and a half for. Oh, got it. That's weird. Yeah, a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Same thing. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I guess my whole business idea isn't going to happen, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you want to make deep make movies. Oh, hey, hey, hey and, and uh, about that, that lot of, the plot of land we were going to buy and build a house. Yeah, that's not happening. We're gonna have to wait a few years for that one, aren't we? Yeah. And I'm definitely not employable anymore if I get out. That's fun. So, or not, I don't know, shit. Yeah, if I get the money back, then... You know, one day at a time, man. Let's try to, uh... Get who knows what kind of footprints they have, and who knows, you might get out, man, you know? Maybe. Maybe you'll be found in... Uh, right now, I just need to treat it like I'm not. Because hope is killer in here. Um, yeah, I just I just need my brother to be helped so that he can be solid and just go go with it and all that. And then um, and and uh, and yeah, that's essentially it. Uh, oh yeah, so yeah, any of the of, of the uh, if you get there, but the sex toy stuff are still there. Just grab it all and put it into. They're all either in drawers in my bed or in and in a. A great bucket by my desk and on my desk. So just put those all in the bucket and give them to Angela, who my, who my brother will know about him. Um, and uh, he'll have her number too. And yeah, that's uh, that's the skinny of it and all that. Um, I expect you both to follow my fitness regimens. <laughs> <laughs> I still got the Google Doc. Actually, I, I, you know what's crazy? Is uh, my, the last drink I had was at the uh, Laugh Factory. The oh, last yeah. time I saw you. Oh, and the last time I had a drink. Oh wait, no, I had a drink after that. But you've been hitting the gym. Even hitting the gym. I've been hitting the gym every morning. Oh. Awesome. I've been the gym. Cool. Cool. I've been focus bench with the creepy jack at 8 in the morning every day. Oh, cool. I've been doing this thing where you um, you stand on one leg and you put your other leg forward and you dip all the way down and then you lift all the way up with your hands held out. It's really difficult, but it's super strengthens your legs. Oh, nice. Yeah, they, have, they I did a YouTube video. I remember when I was getting my DUI that they have a whole, like, uh, prison bed, like, tricep workout, and they have, like, all these workouts that you can do right yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been doing a lot of them. It's it's the only thing to do just to pass the time. Um, so yeah, I've been getting creative with all that shit. And yeah, uh, you, don't, you don't have TV or nothing. They don't give you shit. Huh? There's a TV out in the hallway, so I can like like sit. I'm laying on my back watching it, like on the ground by the door, which is fun. There's only yeah, five minutes to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got you. Yeah, that's true. What's what's that? I think oh, there's a TV behind. I said there's a TV behind you, but then I realized that this is not your cell that you're in. No, but it's the same thing. Like there's a there's a TV. 
in the, in the living room or the yeah, in the hallway, whatever the fuck, and you can like see it from your door. And uh, um, oh, when I was first brought in here, they had me on like suicide watch, so I was I was sleeping. I had like a tarp, like a poncho made out of tarp, like plastic tarp, as clothing. That was my clothing instead of real clothes. So now I'm wearing normal clothes now, but yeah, before it was a nightmare. For like a week, I was wearing a tarp. <laughs> not most, not the most comfortable thing. Uh, I guess I'm officially a bad boy now, right? I've always been kind of. <laughs> oh, no, no, you. Yeah, yeah, right. no, no, you, you won, you, you won that game. Yep, yep. Nito, you're a bad boy now. To, I'm gonna have to change my uh, Twitter handle to uh, quasi, quasi bad <laughs> boy. <laughs> quasi. Medium boy. Diet Coke. Diet. Uh, boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are uh, are people giving you shit for being friends with me? No, um, not really. You know, we, we've really uh, been adamant to anybody who did bring it up that uh, you know nothing's been decided yet. You know, you've only been accused. You haven't been convicted of anything. You know, mm-hmm. everybody's entitled to the presumption of innocence. You know, due process. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It was some shit to pick up to, man, I'll tell you that much. It was some what? I said it was definitely some some weird shit to wake up to. Oh, gotcha. On Sunday or, I mean, on Saturday or Sunday? Uh, Sunday. Okay. They, they, put, it on, they put it on TMZ on, on Saturday night. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, like, like 20, got 20 armed gunmen took me right outside my house. It was, it was insane. Uh, and a girl was in the car with me. I was taking a girl home. Uh, the girl from your birthday party. I was taking her. I was taking a girl home, and then they're like, they're like, all these SUVs stopped in like in front of behind my car, and like had machine or no, like like rifles and handguns pointed at me, and shotguns. Is the second the second arrest or the first? First. The second was the same thing. The se- the second one was at an in and out. The first one was at my house. Oh wow! So she she was right there with it. Yeah, she was not pleased, obviously. Actually, yeah, it was confusing. And then I saw her oh, yeah. there for a while, and I was in the back of my car, and I watched her eventually get taken away, going to take, they drove her home. Oh, I can only imagine what she's thinking now. So, yeah. God damn. And I haven't, I haven't talked to her, I haven't talked to anyone but my brother. Uh, um, yeah. It, what's the number again? My brother? Uh, let me go first. Yep, there you go. Got it. And Andy Purse House. Yeah, Andy Purse House. And, uh, um, and that's the only one we, you don't have to talk to your sister or nothing, right? Just everything to your brother? Yeah, everything to my brother. And, I mean, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's handling everything, which is a lot. He's dealing with a lot. You know? I would imagine. Um, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. If he, yeah, if he, like, and he was, he was super far away. So, if you if you guys have time to go and start packing up my place before he comes up, you know that would be good. And maybe selling, like I just ask him like what furniture he doesn't want, which is probably all of it. Start selling it, you know, or on Craigslist or something. What computers and cameras and stuff? No. <laughs> Furniture, <laughs> like my couches and shit. He's gonna want the cameras. <laughs> uh, yeah, like the couch and like I have tables and stuff. I have, I have, I have the, my, my couches are shit, but the other, but the rest of the stuff is nice. So see, see what you can do as far as maybe setting up like you know, like an eBay thing that's specifically all my stuff kind of thing. Like, if you do that right away, and then that can get out there and, like, post it on the comments of articles on the sites, on all the news sites, and that way maybe people will go and buy it. You know, just any anything to get money from my brother. Yeah, anything what you're saying is, like, the, um, the singer of Corn, Jonathan Davis, he collects mass murder. I'm not calling you a mass murder guy, but he collects, like, Thanks. artifacts and books and stuff like that. It's like a, it's like a thing people collect from drawings from like Manson and shit like that yeah that so see, all these things that are even yeah. something in <laughs> pencil or something you know yeah exactly so and there's even like art books of mine 
that are there's a, there's an art book that's from like my high school that's out in the living room. So maybe that is, the girl the girl was actually pointing out how it had like like bad drawings from a long time ago. So yeah, maybe sell that shit. But yeah. Here, it's real quick. We're gonna do that. You got twenty seconds before yeah. I got a countdown. Oh sorry. Yeah, so tell yeah. what that No no no, that's what I'm saying. Oh yeah, I know I'm watching it. So yeah, and uh, ask him, ask my brother to talk to Forrest because he knows about like manipulating media and stuff too. So maybe talk, maybe communicate with him. He he knows who that is. And yeah, do your best to try and do the whole capitalizing on thing, which Corey clearly, clearly understands. Shut up, Garrett. Thanks, man. Right, See you guys soon. Bye. We are back on the record in this matter. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, an update. I think that uh, sometime next week you will probably get, sometime next week, the final arguments from counsel when they both give their summation of the case, what they believe the evidence is established uh, in this trial, and then you'll begin your deliberation sometime next week. Okay? Just that, that's an update. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, just a reminder. All right? Uh, counsel, you may continue. Yes. Now, going back to your investigation in this case, uh, on February 16, 2020, did you collect the swabs for photo ID number 12, as shown here at people's number 86? Yes. The swab for photo ID number 13, shown here on people's exhibit number, <coughs> and I'm showing the site where the swab, where the location where these items were swabbed. 87C? Yes. And the location for the swab for number 14 is shown here on people's number 86A? Yes. And the swab that's related to the swab taken up uh, for photo ID number 19, the location of photo ID number 19? Yes. Okay. And where did you collect those swabs? I went to uh, the Hertzberg Forensic Science Center over at Cal State Los Angeles, where um, our for one of our forensic units, is DNA unit, located there, along with the sheriffs, and that's where I collected them from Nick Sanchez. The criminals that testified here in court. That's correct. Yes. And was that on February 16, 2020, at about 10:46 in the morning? Yes. And. Photo ID number 12, the swab on the French doors in the living room. Did you mark that as property item number two for this particular case, case number 2006-06220? Yes. And as far as that particular case number, uh, photo ID number 13, which was the uh, related to the stain on the floor, that particular swab, did you book it into evidence as property item number three for this case? Yes. And the swab collected of the red stain from French doors in the living room, photo ID number 14, the other stain, did you book that into evidence as property item number four? Yes. And last, and also booked into uh, under this case number? Yes. And these are the uh, property item numbers that we've been referring to in this particular case? Yes, that's correct. And lastly, the swab from the red stain next to the doorknob on the French doors up in the balcony, uh, was that, that's identified as uh, photo ID number 19, was the swab related to that booked as property item number five? Yes. That was also done all on February 16th? Yes. And under that case number, so what, what happens when you book those items? What, do you, what exactly do you do? Uh, I booked those items into evidence at FFC, and then- uh, What is FFC? Forensic Science Center, uh, LAPD Forensic Science Center over at Hertzburg, Cal State LA, the facility there that they share with the Sheriff's Department. Um, once it gets booked into evidence, then uh, a request is made by the detectives to, for DNA analysis of the items that are booked, which Detective Masterson did. So you and uh, Detective Masterson, as detectives, requested for uh, DNA analysis to be conducted on those particular items? Yes, on items one through five. 
And that's what was done in this case. Yes. Now, uh, did you collect Amy's Harwick's phone? Well, not you personally, but was it eventually Amy Harwick's phone, which was found at her home, was that eventually given to you? Yes. And was there a download of her data from her phone? Yes. And did that take some time? Yes, it did. Uh, is that because the phone was password? Uh, that was a password that you did not have to the phone? That's correct. Okay. And it took some time to get the full download? Yes. Is that because you basically had needed software to break into the phone, the iPhone? Yes. But eventually, did you get the full download? Yes. Okay, and did you download the data so both the people and the defense could have that? Yes. Looking here at people's ex next in order to photograph showing uh, a phone with property item number 41. May this be marked people's next in order? 129. 129. And 129, do you recognize what's shown on photograph A? Yes. What is that? That's the evidence envelope containing Ms. Harwick's phone. As you look at the envelope, you see the date, original property book, which was the 15th of February, 2020. You have the DR number, which is the case number we've been referring to, 2006-06220. And you have my name as employee booking property there down the middle of the uh, envelope, Carranza, with my employee number. And did you, did you designate this phone as property item number 41 for this case? Yes. We're going to photograph B. Is this the back, uh, photo showing the back side of the phone along with that envelope? Yes. And so an extraction was done on the phone, is that correct? Yes. But before we get to that, were you then able to see the actual phone and see if there were any text messages there? Yes. And the text messages, for example, looking at photograph, I think it was exhibit number 10, G, the text message from Fernando Chavez that we showed to the jury, was that on Amy Harwick's cell phone? Yes. Looking at People's Exhibit number 12. See those photographs? Yes. Looking at 12B? Yes. Photograph with, I believe, uh, Ms. Harwick and Ms. Jalot? Yes. Rebecca Jalot? Yes. And photograph 12C? Yes. Were these photographs in Amy's phone when you looked at it? Yes. Looking at People's Exhibit Number 14, I believe this is a message with Ms. Marcy Mendoza. That's correct, yes it is. Did, did you also see this in, in Dr. Amy Harwood's cell phone? Yes, in the cell bright download of the phone. Uh, were you able to see the actual text message on the phone? Yes. Now, you said the Cellbrite download. Can you tell the jury what is a, a Cellbrite download of a cell phone? Uh, the Cellbrite is a program that uh, our forensic experts use to download a cell phone. And what the program does, it pretty much downloads the phone and puts it in an easy to read format for the investigator to go through. You can look to see how many text messages, how many photographs, how many calls, the contact list. Anything that's stored on that cell phone is downloaded and uh, put in a Celebrite reader, which makes it easier for us to, uh, to look at the phone. Instead of looking at the physical phone, you look at that reader and you have everything categorized by categories. Yeah, for example, I'm gonna have a two-page document. Can I want to just one more? Yes. <coughs> document it is a Celebrite printout for text messages between Hernando Chavez and uh, Cat Dukes Histon with the phone number 626-347-7623. May this remark people's next in order? Uh, 130A through C. <clears throat> 130A. 
see. So looking here at 130A, you can tell the jury what is shown here. Yes, that's a Celebrite extraction report that I created um, from the cell phone uh, Celebrite program. You can actually create a PDF of the items you're looking at and put it in this format so it's easy to read. And now these block uh, sections, that's uh, pursuant to court order redactions, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So here it says the number of an individual <coughs> on the report says Hernando Chavez and it gives the phone number of that individual, right? Yes. And then it has Kat, someone calling themselves Cat Dukes Histon owner and the number is 626-347-7623. Yes. Whose phone number is that? Amy Harwick. So whoever has this phone, they decided to call themselves that? Yes. Uh, so basically, Amy Harwick is calling herself that? Yes. <coughs> and just to show the jury, so the language here on page B, where this text in green, Gareth found my number, and messaged me, I told him, I don't want to talk, and wished him the best, but his response was still obsessive and scary. Is that the same as a text message provided by Mr. Hernando Chavez, shown on People's Exhibit 10G? Yes. So, so you're verifying that those text messages are also on the Celebrite? Yes. And you did that with all the messages, uh, for example, of Marcy Mendoza and Rebecca Jalot? Yes, I created PDF files mm -hmm. from the Celebrite with all those messages. Did you also find messages uh, that defendants sent Amy Harwick on her phone? Yes. And did you uh, print out the Celebrite mm -hmm. to, so we could see those messages? Yes, I created a PDF of that and uh, turned it over to your office. Can you have one moment, Your Honor? I have an exhibit with photograph with screenshots, well not screenshots, printout and celebrate uh, pages A through H. May this be marked people's next in order? 131. 131. Right. So here, the very top of the celebrate report says for the participants in this printout that you generated. At Gareth Purse House. And is that his number? 760-809. I'm sorry, 760-809-2732? Yes. And then to <coughs> this number, Cat Dukes? Yes, Ms. Pers uh, sorry, Ms. Uh, Harwick's number. Okay, so now let's look at the a message. And the, do the message, messages have a date and time when they were sent? Yes. And so for example, here, uh, with the message, uh, when it's sent, where would, where would the time be for the, where it was sent? Is that, am I pointing to it? Or it's is it this other time when it's okay, red? Okay, well, you're, it has from and to, and then it has delivered red, and it has when it's red. Okay. The so date, 1-17-2020, a.m., uh, UTC minus 8. So what does that mean? Um, this is already, the program already uh, takes into account the date and time, Pacific Standard Time, so it puts that, that time on the cell right download. So UTC minus eight. This is the actual time this message was read, at eleven fifty two oh four. So it might it it converts the time from UTC time, which is also known as Greenwich Village time, and converts it to local time. So then this message was read on January seventeenth, twenty twenty, at about eleven fifty one a.m. Eleven fifty two oh four. Eleven. I'm sorry. Eleven fifty one. Eleven fifty one a.m. Or, or actually, it's eleven fifty two oh four, where it's read okay. at the upper. All right, eleven fifty-two, uh, and the message is from the person Gareth. I interneted your number. Recognize it now that I see it. Is that correct? Yes. And then the response. Well, then there was another text message from Gareth. If I'm allowed to text, and that's at uh, also at eleven fifty-two. Read right at eleven fifty-two a.m. Yes. Can I B. The response 
No creo que algo así a... And then, so as you're looking at the server, are you looking at the chain of text message, messages that is going on between Gareth and this person? Yes. And is there a response at 11:55 a.m.? Well, is there a response is, with the three with letters with three letters P P P? Yes. So you don't know what Dr. Amy Harwick was doing when she pressed the P three times. No, no idea. And then at 11.55, another text message from Amy Harwick to Gareth, P, capital P and small p. Yes. So you don't know why that's happening. No idea. And then at 11.56, there's another message from Miss Harwick to Gareth where it's just several P's are, are being pressed. At the, at the same time, right? Yes. Looking at page C of this exhibit, is this a response? I believe it's cut off where it's, it's Gareth to uh, Cat Dukes, correct? Yes. Uh, and so it's a message from Gareth saying, yes, we shall all pee at 1156, correct? Yes. And then the response at 11.58 by Ms. Persaus is PP and POP. You mean Ms. Harwick? Ms. Harwick, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you for correcting me. <coughs> and then there's another message from Ms. Harwick right after that at 11.59 a.m. And I'm not counting the seconds, but you know, I'm just looking at the, at the minutes, 11.59. Does she indicate, oh, wow. My text was left open and I'm on call. Sorry. Yes. Now looking at page D, I think this is cut off, but this is these are all messages from between uh, Mr. Pursehouse and Ms. and Dr. Amy Harwood. Yes, that's correct. From her phone. Yes. Okay, and at about eleven uh, about twelve oh one PM now, is it Mr. Pursehouse stating on this text, so you're not just really into talking about P now. That's correct, yes. And then Ms. Harwick responds at 12.09, and there appears to be a symbol. Do you see that? Yes. And what does that look like? What does that look to you? I don't know what it is. Okay. The symbol of a woman or something? Uh, he'd be speculating. Yeah. Huh? He'd be speculating. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Looking at the next text message, is this a text message from what would be Miss Dr. Harwick to the defendant. Yes. And does she state, I'm glad we had a chance to speak last night. It sounds like we both needed to express and hear some things from the other person. Yes. Then looking at page E. Does Gareth, Gareth respond? Just sometimes P got it at 12.11. Yes. And at 12.12, does he send another text? Does Gareth send another text to Amy? I'm sometimes why? Yes. And then another text at 12, 12 p.m. Yeah, I need it. Still do. I slept well. Yes. Looking at photograph F. Message from first house to Amy at about 12, 12, 32 seconds, almost an hour. Yes. 
another message from First House to Amy Harwick at 12 12 with 46 seconds at 7 a.m. Yes. Then another text message from First House to Dr. Harwick at 12 14, about two minutes later, correct? Yes. States, and I'm right now listening to a phone conference literally about organizing psych articles for the rapists. Yes. Looking at text G. This is uh, another text from Gareth Pursehouse to Dr. Amy Harwick at, on the same date at 12.17 now. Yeah. Yes. And is it, not sure if you're done because you said how we finished this now last night, but if we can meet again. Yes. Okay. And up to this point, Dr. Amy Howard has not sent other text messages <coughs> in response to this, to this last part of the conversation. No. And looking now at 1226, is this the text message that you saw on the celebrate from Dr. Amy Howard to uh, Garrett Pursehouse? Yes. Okay, and it says, I think it was really good that we were able to speak last night. I'm sure there's a lot more that you want to process and say to me, but I think, but I think that was a lot for both of us. I hope you were able to hear me last night when I said that I was sorry for anything that caused you suffering and that I forgive you for the things that you did to me. I think right now it's best to have some space, and I don't mean that in a negative way. The past is sad and triggering for both of us. I think we ended our talk last night well. We can be civil from a distance, respect each other, and move forward with our own lives. Is that the message that was sent? Yes. Then at about 30 minutes or so later at 12.50, is there a message showing that Garrett Pursehouse responded, so you're still gone, which is exactly my nightmare and sadly what I expected. It feels the same as when I wrote you that long list of what I would miss about you and heard nothing back, just reaching out into the darkness trying to stop falling. I wish I could do something more, but reaching out to you is crippling action that I had actually contemplated several times over the past few months, just to say to you, just to say to you the word help, admitting to you how hurt I am, I'm so embarrassing and painful, which demolish me, demolishes me even more because it used to be I told you every detail about, about myself no matter what. Is that the message that's sent at about 12.48 p.m.? Yes. And these are like the last three messages in this chain. Looking at the top one, there's another message from Gareth Pursehouse to Dr. Amy Howard at 2 p.m. I don't, I don't know how busy you are, and it truly scares me so much more than I can possibly convey to say this. Please don't just vanish on me. Please don't let me go through that again. Is that message sent to Dr. Harwood at about 2 o'clock and four, four, 44 seconds? Yes. And there's another message at 4 minutes later at 2 or 4 p.m. from Garrett Persos to Dr. Amy Harwood. Even when I was Laying in bed last night, I put on Star Trek, and the first episode was Will Riker and Diana Troy, therapist, going through a bizarrely similar situation. I assume Marcy used her psychic powers for that. Now, did you know that Marcy Mendoza, her friend, works as a psychic? Who objected to that as hearsay speculation? Uh, I don't know. Does do well? It's not hearsay. Uh, do Do you know that, sir? Yes, sir. I do. Okay. Yeah, well, how do you know that? Was it based on something somebody told you? It's uh, based on the interview that uh, Do uh, Detective Masterson had with her. And All right, conversations I'll, I'll sustain it on your side, guys. Looking at the next text message, uh, is this a text message from Purse House to Dr. Amy Harwood later that day at 6.54? Please call me. Yes. And on the celebrate, did you see Dr. after that last message that Dr. Amy Harwick sent about well, let's move on with our lives? Did you did you see any text messages messages where she's texting him back? No. 
Now, the following day, does the celebrate show that the defendant left a voicemail message for her? Yes. And was this about a, like a 9, 10 second voicemail message? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I have a CD labeled Persaud's voicemail with the date of August 18, 2020. Actually, uh, I'm going to move on from this exhibit and probably play it tomorrow. You still want to mark it as 132? Yeah. Yes, 132. Uh, yes. And the, and the transcript as 132A? Yes. But it's just about 4 o'clock, Council. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just play it tomorrow. Okay, very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, have a safe evening. We'll see you then, all right? Thank you. And I'll